I would like to call the August 24th Board of Education meeting to order. Wichita Public Schools will be the district of choice in our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Mike, would you read the COVID-19 uh, information for us, please? Yes. My name is Mike Willamy, Clerk of the Board. This regularly scheduled public meeting of the Wichita Public Schools is taking place at the North High Lecture Hall, 1437 Rochester in Wichita. Due to the governor's declaration of emergency and due to health and safety concerns that exist because of COVID-19, no members of the public are present at this meeting. The meeting is available to be viewed live by the public in the following ways. WPS-TV on Cox Cable Channel 20, the district's website at www.usd259.org forward slash WPS-TV online and live stream apps for phone, Roku, and Apple TV by searching WPS-TV. Following the conclusion of today's meeting, this meeting will be available on the WPS YouTube channel. It will also be rebroadcast on WPS-TV Cox Cable Channel 20. The agenda for this meeting was published on August 20th, 2020 at www.usd259.org forward slash BOE under the BOE Meetings, Agendas and Minutes tab. The news media also received the main agenda and a portfolio containing the appendices. Revisions made after publication but prior to this meeting were updated on August 24th at 1.10 p.m. This version is being displayed at the meeting. At this meeting, all board members, district staff, and presenters will identify themselves by name and position before they speak to assist the public in following the meeting. The usual public communications item that allows members of the public to speak at board meetings has been removed from the agenda. In its place, an email public comments item has been added. Information about how patrons can submit email public comments is included on page one of the BOE agenda. Public communications will not be placed back in the agenda until the public again starts attending meetings. There will be an executive session at the end of this meeting. The following procedure will be used concerning the executive session. A motion will be presented by a board member that states the subject matter and justification under the Kansas Open Meetings Act for going into executive session. The motion will state the time the board will return from the executive session. The live broadcast of the meeting will not end until the board returns from executive session and adjourns the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Under reports, Report from Service Employees International Union. Good evening, Esau. Welcome. We're glad to have you here again. Good evening, everyone. President Logan, Dr. Thompson, board members, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening, and I just want to let you know how much I appreciate the decision that you guys made last week and uh, to keep our staff safe. And uh, I did have one question for clarification. I noticed that everybody in this room is doing a terrific job of wearing their masks and there's plexiglass in between us and things like that. But there was some language in the um, document in the orange that I just wanted some clarification when it talks about social distancing and masks. Um, was it the board's intent when they passed this that people would wear masks when they are in buildings like this? Because I, I feel like there's some confusion and I'd like to be able to give a solid answer to the staff members as to what your intent was um, because at times uh, when people are in their office alone or you know there isn't anybody around a person will often take their mask down to breathe for a minute or put in a piece of candy and not 
you know, get it back up, and they, and they just forget about it. And I think the district's been really great, and I appreciate them reminding everyone to put those back on. Um, but just so everybody knows, could you, could you clarify that? And if you'd like to do that now, that'd be fine, or I had one other thing to say, so. Well, I, I think the board's intent is that we wear masks when, in the dis when we're in the district. Okay. Now, if you're in a room shut down, closed by yourself, it is possible you might remove your mask, but the minute you start moving out anywhere else in the building, you have to have a mask on. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. I just, because, you know, you guys are wearing your masks even though you have the plexiglass here in between you to protect you, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, also, uh, the staff is very appreciative of you working with them and making sure that they're able to serve the district, and I, when we came in, I saw all the kids out exercising their, their right to free speech, and I really appreciate that they're out there doing that. And it looks like they're all doing it very safely um, to uh, wear their masks. And I just, I, I don't mean this in a snarky way, but I do, I do think that it is uh, uh, very nice that we can worry about first world things like that. Um, that our city workers have been going to work and making sure that everybody has running water and toilets and sanitation that flush in the middle of this pandemic and that we can worry about things that we're passionate about like school athletics. Um, but I do want everyone to remember that the reason that we're here is for education and I wish there was that many kids out there screaming, let us in the doors so we can learn. And I do just want to make sure and protect our staff as we, as we move forward and I I just, I know that it's challenging and I know you guys make these decisions that are very hard and I just wanna tell you thank you and I know you've been probably getting angry phone calls and people who are upset and I appreciate you being patient with them and, and being kind in your responses. So thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, we have heard from a lot of people and that's good, we like to hear from people. Uh, Kim, United Teachers of, of Wichita. Good evening, President Logan, Dr. Thompson, and members of the board. Um, after Thursday's decision, I think middle and high school teachers are relieved now that they have a plan to move forward, so they can now begin to plan what their classes will look like online and how best to help our students during this challenging time. Um, elementary also needs to start planning, but many of them are still waiting for students to enroll, so administrators will know how many my school remote teachers are needed. Um, teachers are planners, and this situation is kind of wrecking havoc with us since we can't plan. Um, one thing elementary teachers are going to need in the next two weeks is time to work in their classrooms. There are three contract days of working in their rooms came that second week of August, and many of them didn't have any idea of um, how many students they would have, the names of their students, um, or even what exactly they would be teaching, my remote or in person. Um, so as a teacher told me today, my head is so full from all of the online professional development, I need time to process what I'm learning and how to apply it. Um, and in some places that's happening and some they're struggling with that. Um, this teacher said they were spending a lot of their afternoon in required meetings and they really just needed to get in their rooms to wrap their head around what it's gonna look like. So time, in their, time to work in their classrooms and plan would be greatly appreciated. Um, another concern we're hearing about deals with pre-K. They are having in-person parent orientation for three days before school starts, and the pre-K teachers are concerned about having the parents in their classrooms in groups of five adults and five students for about an hour at a time. Um, so we'd ask you to please look at that and maybe reconsider that and see how that could be done differently. And lastly, I wanna address fall sports. Um, I received a ton of phone calls from parents and they were asking me to vote to reverse the decision to cancel fall sports. And they were a little surprised when I told them I don't have a vote at BOE meetings. <laughs> um, the only thing that UTW Executive Board has addressed with the BOE is the gating criteria and basing the reopening decision on science. And we have not taken a position, nor have we even had a conversation about fall sports. We were just concentrating on the classroom. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our teachers have been working very hard, I know, to try to deal with this new, new way we're, that we're doing school right now. Next item, Mike. Public hearing on the 2021 budget. 
State statute requires the board hold a public hearing on the proposed 2020-21 budget. The purpose of this hearing is to hear and answer objections of taxpayers related to the proposed budget and for purposes of considering amendments to the proposed budget. The proposed budget documents and the budget at a glance are available for review at the Alvin E. Morris Administrative Center at 903 South Edgemore in Wichita. Susan Willis, the district's chief financial officer, will make a brief presentation on the budget. Following the presentation, members of the public who have registered to speak in accordance with requirements published in tonight's agenda may address the board. Following receiving of statements by the public, the board president will close the public hearing. The adoption of the proposed budget is scheduled for later in tonight's meeting. No action is to be taken at the public hearing. We have two persons registered to speak under the public hearing for the budget. Thank you and welcome. We're glad to have you here. We want to listen to your presentation and then we absolutely want to hear from these two speakers. Absolutely. Good evening, President Logan, Superintendent Thompson, members of the board. Um, tonight, we are going to give a very short recap of the budget uh, for fiscal year 21 that we presented to you two weeks ago before we open the public hearing. Um, at the close of the public hearing, um, myself and our budget director, Addie Lowell, can return to the board table to answer any questions that the board might have at that time. But just as to recap before the hearing, um, this is our um, budget hearing and hopefully adoption later um, after the hearing closes for the fiscal 21's uh, budget year. As a, as a reminder, uh, next slide please. As a reminder to the board, uh, a few of the highlights and assumptions that were used to build this budget. Our base state aid did increase from $4,436 per pupil to $4,000 $569 per pupil. Uh, that funded base aid FTE, uh, we, we budgeted for a decrease of 182.9 FTE as we look back to these, either the highest or the second highest year and we are looking back to fiscal year 19 to build the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, we built the budget anticipating a decrease in weightings, so that is the additional funding we get for um, high needs groups, including at risk, bilingual, um, career and tech ed. It, 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 we also receive some weightings um, related to to that um, population. But our our estimates are that those populations, because of our overall decline, will also decrease. We, are, we budgeted a 1% to 2% decline, but we actually feel the, the true numbers will come in a little bit less than that. Um, but we have built in those contingencies into the budget should those f counts actually fluctuate. And certainly in this year where there are a tremendous number of unknowns, even as we go into the start of school here in two weeks, I think we're going to need that budget, um, those budget flexibility and contingency pieces. So we did, um, we did budget around a 4.5% assessed valuation growth, and we are exercising 33% um, of the LOB within this budget. Next slide, please. So our proposed mill levy actually overall decreased 0.21 mills. Um, we are 20 mills in the general fund, which is statutorily set. We're up a little bit on the LOB, which again, as we go to 33%, you would expect that to go up. Capital outlay um, basically remains at eight, eight mills, which is the maximum uh, authority within that fund. Bond and interest, we were able to pull down just a little bit based on our uh, long-term forecasting. Uh, the same with special liability, which again brings the overall levy down 0.21 mills. Next slide. Again, the historical trends in, uh, for our mill levy history for USD 259 have really hovered in that 52 to 53 range um, with a few fluctuations up when we were having um, equity issues in the formula over the years. But generally speaking, you can say our mill levy has been pretty consistent over the, over the past 10 years. So we are proposing a, a net budget increase of 40, almost $48 million. We are proposing a maximum budget authority figure of $809 million. Um, which is the maximum we will be able to spend if all the funds come in as expected. 
So certainly that happens every year. We, we budget a maximum amount, and typically those numbers then come in less, and where our actuals then are quite a bit less than that. But we cannot spend more than $809 million without coming back to you for um, a revised budget item. That budget, next slide please, thank you, uh, is, is built around the concept of supporting students. So uh, as we've talked about over the past few years, our budgeting process really does try to revolve around the district strategic plan. And within that plan, we are focusing as much of our operational dollar on the classroom as we possibly can. And right now, 87% um, of our operating budget is focused specifically on the direct support of students which again is a priority of the board and certainly a, a priority when we look at the overall budgeting process. So with that, um, I will pause for any initial questions before we'd open the public hearing. I am seeing none right now. Okay. So we Thank will you. call our first speaker, Joy Akins. We're, we're sorry, we're sending you across the room, but we want you to have a mic. <laughs> Welcome, Joy, it's good to see you back. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'm sorry, President Logan, <laughs> Superintendent Thompson, and board, it is good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, for those watching at home, I'm a former school board member. Uh, Julie Hedrick came after me, and she serves in District 2, and it was a great honor to be part of the Wichita School Board and the work that you do. And it's good to see so many staff here today that I worked with for so long. Um, Julie, I'm, could you speak up just a little oh, bit? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's harder with these masks, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> thank, thank you. Okay, well, um, I'm here today to talk to you about the budget for 2021. I noticed in your budget that you have lowered the debt service on bond and interest by 1.25 mils, but increased the LOB by 1.183. The bond debt service pays for the bond we used for schools that have not had children since March and will not have, and many will not have children for another nine weeks. And rather than pass that savings from the bond debt services onto your fellow taxpayers, you've increased your LOB budget. Now, as I recall from my time on the board and the many, many training sessions we have, <laughs> the LOB budget is that local option budget that districts use to run programs that are special to a local district. 60% of our funds are used for things like culinary arts, CNA classes, fire safety training, and other hands-on CTE courses for our students. It's also used for at-risk student work and other items like fuel and transportation. At the same time you're raising your LOB for those kinds of things, I'm noticing that you'll not be providing many of these services for our sixth to 12th grade students for at least nine weeks or a quarter of the school year. You can't really do a hands-on CNA course remotely. You can't really fight a fire over a computer. Neither did you provide them for the last quarter of the last school year, even though that wasn't your decision. For me, the disconnect is this. As a board, you have championed government education and fought off any attempts at other models, telling us that you know best how to educate our children We've made a pact with you that you'll provide not only education, but sports and activities and music, CTE training. You'd help our students with psychology and help them when they're struggling with their social emotional needs. You've told us that other models that we might consider in the public leave our vulnerable children at greater risk as those models that we might consider would never take care of the vulnerable children the way you will. You want a lawsuit that provides a million more in resources and you've received COVID dollars from Sedgwick County from our federal taxes. And at the moment when our most vulnerable students need school the most, they need connection, you choose to offer remote only courses and do not even offer extracurricular activities for our students. What our children in this community need is connection, connection to their peers, connection to caring, loving adults in the classroom, connection to therapists who care about them and can help them, connections to coaches. That's what they need. That's what, and CDC director just talked about how, what best fights addiction and abuse and all of these things is connections. And what our kids have most lost are the connections. 
And so instead, our kids find themselves trying to figure out how to maneuver on their own, and you do this while you keep our money. Look, I know it's a difficult process. I mean, I never dealt with something like this while I was on the board. But this has been difficult for all of us as well. Business owners, taxpayers, we've had to figure out how to handle this ourselves. We've handled it in our business while our employees and customers were still walking in the doors. Only we had to take out loans and put things on credit because our income is not secure. And we did it all while we were taking care of educating our own children at home for the last six months. Okay. Uh, Ms. Akins, can you wrap up? I have one sentence left. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. If you aren't going to offer our children the services and the connections they deserve, please consider giving the money back to taxpayers so we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joshua Ligon. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Is everybody able to hear me all right? Step closer and yeah. maybe raise the mic a little. Yes, it's a, it, with the mask, it's a little harder. So <laughs> just is. speak up. You'll be okay, fine. Okay, I hear myself now. And then, yeah, lean in. <clears throat> okay, well, um, thank you for having me. I'm not, I've never done this before, so I'm not really quite sure how to do this. Um, I just had some questions about, or some things to, I guess bring about about the budget and where the money might be going. If the students aren't in school and they're not taking part in their activities, what are we using the money for? What does it, how does it get reallocated for things that benefit our children and our teachers in this school district? Um, I'm sure that you guys have a plan and that'll show up and we'll see that as things go, but this is something that I just wanted to address and felt like we needed to. Um, parents out there looking and they got all these questions and they, they don't know any more than I do. Uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> For the students that are, that are doing the remote learning, the money that comes in from, the, the way I understand it, from those programs, if they do the Remote learning completely, it is, there's a $5,000 deal that goes with the school, with the school of, that they're enrolled in. If they're a partial enrollee in the remote school, there's a $1,700 diff, uh, monetarily, monetary um, number. I don't, I mean, I don't know exactly how it works. But it seems that my student who's a senior at South High is being forced to take a full caseload because of the money that comes in, not because of what he needs. He only needs three graduating, three courses to graduate, but he's being forced to take a full course load because of this money that's going from this remote learning is what it seems like to us. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, it's not right because these students have worked and they shouldn't have to go to school extra because the money is different if they go to school longer. Um, the food money, what are we gonna do with that? Can it not be reallocated for things like streaming media for the programs that they're outside fussing about? No parents, just streaming with, the, with, the, with them. These are just options. <clears throat> I guess that's kind of mostly what I had written down here, my points, but I, cause I really don't know how to put them out cause I don't know exactly how you guys do what you do. Um, I'm just a concerned parent, and <clears throat> I felt like I had to come and figure out something or say something or something. I don't know, but I'm here, and I'm with you guys whatever way I can so that I can help between here and everybody outside, and we can make things as best as we can for all of our students. Thank you. And thank you, and we really appreciate your being here. And you don't have to know all the answers. We'll help you explain it to you. But you've asked questions about 
the remote learning and your senior, and you've also asked a question about the food. We are going to have a report later tonight. We're going to provide food for our students because that's critical that we do that. So if you would like, we could have someone visit with you to answer your questions. Would you like for us to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, if we could see that that happens, Dr. Thompson. We have your contact information. Do you expect to hear from someone? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Either way, they, they both go out, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay, would you like to continue, Susan? I think Dr. Willoughby might have a, something to read. Oh, okay. Continuing under finance, the 2020-21 budget adoption. On August 10th, 2020, the Board of Education approved the notice of hearing provided in Appendix 1 which when published establishes the maximum amounts for the 2020-21 budget. The notice was published in the Wichita Eagle and the Derby Informer, which is Sedgwick County's official newspaper of record on August 12, 2020, with the public hearing scheduled at the beginning of tonight's meeting. The board will have the opportunity to ask questions if necessary following the public hearing. Following the board's adoption, the 2020-21 budget will be sent to Sedgwick County and the Kansas State Department of Education. It is recommended that the board adopt the 2020-21 budget. Okay, and before we continue on, I do need to uh, officially close the public hearing. So, Susan, if you want to continue on now. Thank you. Um, I will invite our budget director to the podium, um, Addie Lowell, in case the board has um, some follow-up questions from the public hearing. <coughs> Okay. We have been asked to um, adopt the 2021 budget, and are there questions? Uh, Stan? I beg your pardon, Ron. I'm sorry. Ron. Well, I was just going back to what the speakers were talking about, and will that, um, those questions be answered later? Um, because it sounds like I, they might be able to answer them right now as far as the... Um, the money allocation if somebody is, is there uh, a difference between somebody who is in person versus remote? Is there a different allocation in that? So I think you're speaking about our second speaker and his questions about his, the student, is that the question? Correct. Okay. So I when he, the numbers he was quoting were, this, were the state aid for the EI Academy, so our virtual program. And that is a current year waiting. So as you enroll in EI Academy, and you go through the official count process, we look at how many hours that particular student is enrolled in that program. If that student is a full-time, we do get the full 5,000. If that student is part-time, it's 1,700. But we don't require the student to be full-time. We measure what the student is at the time of the counting. The traditional students, so in that particular gentleman's case, um, his high school student, Again, recall that those, those traditional per pupil allocations are actually built on the FTE established in this case two years ago. So whether that student is three hours or a full-time student, whatever that student takes for, from a funding perspective, that's irrelevant to our budget because our budget looks at FTE on traditional students from either the previous year or two years back. So it's only the true virtual program, our EI Academy, that is looking at current year enrollment, and we don't dictate to the student. We might encourage them to be full-time because it's, it's financially sound, but also good for the student, particularly in an EI Academy situation. But for the rest of the traditional students, we're not looking at their student schedule or having any conversation around any sort of hours because of finances. Thank you. And then the uh, other one was on the first speaker as far as um, some money that is, quote, saved because the buildings are not operating. Uh, what, what, what's our uh, perspective on that or what's our analysis and sure. are there savings? And if so, how do we how do we manage that money? Sure, sure. Um, I, will, I will remind the board that 75 percent of our budget um, are people. So our teachers, our paras, our custodians, our um, classified clerical staff, um, administ building administrators, 
Um, and all of those people are needed, whether we're in person, whether we're remote, or we're basically pivoting back and forth. Mm -hmm. So if there are savings to be had while we're in a remote setting, it might be in utilities. We might have, a, it might have to run the air conditioner um, slightly less hard, if you will, because there are fewer bodies in the building. Um, we might not have as many lights on in the evenings because there are fewer evening activities. So there could be savings in utilities. Um, that will depend on how long we stay in that particular um, state. If it's the full nine weeks, certainly we will accumulate that information as far as potential savings. And then we are going to be able to deploy it in other areas of the budget where we are seeing needs. Um, and I will just share just a little bit of information. Um, we had, I think, shared with the, the, as far as our federal dollars, our CARES dollars, that we were going to get probably between 15 and 15 and a half direct to us after we passed through um, a piece of the CARES funding to the non-public institutions. Of that money, essentially $15 million is gone um, based on spending related to technology, cleaning supplies, masks, handheld thermometers, additional ingenuity licenses, pre-K iPads, signage and printing. Um, I have a whole laundry list of things that we've been spending those dollars on, and essentially it is spent. Um, things that we haven't covered um, that we will need to use other, other budget authority for include um, COVID leave um, expenses, so the, the um, federally mandated periods of time that an employee is off and gets paid leave under the FFCRA, that's an expense to us that we typically don't have um, in addition to their regular leave. So there's those costs. There's lunchroom supervision as we have to socially distance those students and we need more bodies doing more of that work. So there's those expenses. There's the increased HVAC expenses we've talked about, um, the loss of nutrition services revenue, the loss of Medicaid reimbursement from the spring, um, the loss of wellness credits, uh, because we've th waived that requirement because it's difficult for our employees to get in to see physicians, particularly during those times where they were limited on who they could see. So that those expenses, just in that short list, that's about $8 million. So those are items that we have to figure out how to compensate for, and if we have some utility savings, for example, because we're shut down for a period of time as far as no students or very few students in a building and we're just talking st teaching staff and and para support, then those, that's where those dollars will go is to kind of fill some of those other holes. So we built the budget based on a 33% maximum LOB authority because we knew there were going to be so many unknowns coming at us. We wanted to give ourselves some room to maneuver the budget where it needs to go. And in this case, we were able to do it um, with an overall mill levy decrease, slight as it was. You're saying that the savings that we, we did have was spent and then some, right? Is it, it, is, if it, that's any savings we will have okay. is spent and then some, at right. least at this point. Again, it's right. early. It's only August. We haven't even, we haven't even really g g pushed into the school year much. So right mm -hmm. now I would be guessing what the savings would be. We might be able to forecast. But again, we've not... We've not operated the buildings with teachers only in it, so mm -hmm. I don't know how much energy that's actually going to take. We'll see that in those first few weeks, and then we can start forecasting out. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm seeing no other questions. I do uh, need to have a, a motion if we are ready. Stan? I move that we, well, before I make that motion, um, also just to uh, maybe to help out anyone who's watching, uh, we started these budget briefings in January of 2020, and they're on the YouTube channel. So uh, I actually watched, re-watched them to, uh, to be prepared for this meeting, and it took about uh, a little less than four hours to watch them. And so if you're really, really interested in this, it is a really good way of, of decide, finding out exactly where we're spending the money, uh, the whole issues about savings, uh, what we're facing this upcoming year. So I encourage everyone to do that. And I move that we adopt the 2021 uh, budget. Ron Rosales, District 6, I second. Okay, the motion was made by Stan Reeser and seconded by uh, Ron Rosales. 
And I'm seeing no other questions. Would you please cast your vote? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Next item, Mike. Email public comment. We have 11 persons who provided emails, uh, and those emails were sent to the board this morning. Yes, and I have read them all, and we will certainly make sure that those are attached to the minutes of this meeting so that the public can read them as well. Next item. Under education, Fall 2020 Student Device and Learning Experience. Device access has become a default delivery mechanism for content for learning. In addition, the assignment process has become transformational due to the nature of the district's response to COVID and the availability of devices. Chief Information Officer Rob Dixon will present on the device deployment process, our shift to digital learning and supporting parents through Parent University. It is recommended the board approve for the district to enter into an agreement with Seesaw for a 36 month subscription for the assignment workflow of pre-K two students in the amounts not to exceed $66,000 for year one, $33,000 for year two, and $33,000 for year three for a total amount of $132,000. Good evening. Good evening. Thank Welcome, Rob. Thanks, President Logan, Dr. Thompson, members of the board. So uh, I have in front of you a, a ton of slides to take a look at, and uh, but a lot of this is talking about what that device and learning experience looks like for our students. A couple highlights. Next slide. Um, this last Friday, we had our first session for um, our parent university, and it was uh, an incredible hit. We had uh, over 2,000 participants in our uh, five sessions that we offered, and uh, you can imagine working, uh, you know, question and answer for 2,000 people asking questions all at once. It's, it's kind of just craziness for that hour for that session, and so uh, give a, a ton of respect to our IST Instructional Technology Group, Diane Smokorowski, Josh, Joshua Errett, um, Tana Reuter, they did amazing in planning out that, and as well as uh, Lori Newton in doing uh, Parent View. So some of the topics that we hit on was digital literacy, digital citizenship, digital well-being. So thinking about as every student has access to a device, what that looks like and what does screen time look like, because it's about what you do on the device as much as it is the time that you're using on that device. And so then also thinking about being informed as a parent, you know, how do you connect with us virtually? What does it look like inside of Teams? And uh, how to see progression inside of Parent View. And as we, as we progress, it's just making sure that those parents are more well informed about their students' education because you know, the, the dynamic has shifted in remote learning where that family unit is now at home and not only might the parents be working, but you also have learning happening within that same unit. So there's a shift there. And so, uh, next slide. Teams updates. So uh, we've done a, a ton of uh, enhancements to Microsoft Teams uh, here recently. We added direct dial phone numbers Inside the teams, the board approved that a couple, I can't remember how many board meetings ago, because uh, we have so many right now. But it was, yeah. <laughs> it was <We> noticed. <laughs> a, a couple board meetings ago, we approved that. And we've been deploying, I want to say we have 5,000 numbers now inside of Microsoft Teams assigned to staff. We have another 1,000 to go prior to school opening. And then at that point, uh, we'll be able to offer that number instead of their classroom number if they're not in that classroom setting. And so then, uh, uh, you know, I know in the springtime, there were concerns of uh, teachers having to hand out their cell phone numbers and other things. They can now do all of those inside of Teams. So they can receive phone calls and they can make phone calls inside of Teams without having to hand out that number. 
preview of breakout rooms that will be hitting our tenant here very soon. I can't really acknowledge when that happens. Uh, it's a, a bit NDA, but um, what that will allow a teacher to do is break students out into multiple groups, have them work on independent work and come back as a large group without having to set up individual meetings for those breakout groups. So they can do that ad hoc at once. Once they've met, they can break those students into whatever size groups that they want. Those students can work independently and that teacher can just chime in and see how they're doing and then bring the entire group back uh, for group discussion. Class Insights is a, is a dashboard for a teacher, but it also rolls up to a principal and also to a district level to offer the amount of time spent on an assignment inside of Teams, the amount of apps, the number of meetings, to under kind of get a, a good measurement of what engagement looks like in that remote learning setting. And so we've rolled out uh, Class Insights this week. We'll have more information for our teachers uh, later on this week on Class Insights. Focus mode, I'm super excited when that hits our tenant. That will allow a teacher to uh, create a wireframe of the content that they wanna show. And then let's say I have uh, a hearing uh, disability child. I can have another frame that's identified that I can maybe put a person in to do um, uh, sign language. Or I can have a reference content that's up there that I'm going to constantly reference while I'm doing content. So it, it allows a lot of flexibility in the teacher to uh, shape what that student sees on the other end. Because right now, uh, we had uh, some updates to at least allow 49 students to be seen on a screen. You can imagine what that looks like with 49 students across that screen going across a meeting. So this will allow a teacher to kind of manage what that content looks like. Next slide. Surface Pro, so after September 4th, we will have deployed a little over 4,000 Surface Pros and offered at least an hour of professional development to every single one of those staff members. Um, that will cover uh, K through six and high school uh, at that time with Surface Pro devices. And so those teachers have now will be introduced to a modern computing device that allows them to digital ink, allow them to wirelessly display, uh, do all the cool things that Dr. Thompson does, you know, in her, in her daily walk, right, on her service. And so it's been uh, a great exercise. Teachers have loved it. We've, that also on top of that allowed us to add a layer of security to enable teachers to have two-factor authentication that will uh, uh, add a layer of security so that they, their accounts can't be fished their passwords can't be stolen because if somebody tries to log in from another location, it'll send them a text message. So it, it's incorporating similar styles to what you see in your bank uh, into our regular authentication mode. So next slide. Professional Development Month. Wow. We have uh, in... Uh, the days that we have, so we have 12 professional development days, eight of those days have been around technology. By the end of this cycle, we will have done 160 technology sessions. And so there have been, uh, started out really well with Mark Sparville, who did our keynote session, and Dr. Thompson introduced us. We had uh, well over 5,000 people in a Teams live session at one time. Uh, that was the most I've ever seen in one online session, but uh, I think it, it, it turned out really well. We got uh, some great feedback on that, as well as we've been doing tons of sessions around Microsoft Teams, tons of sessions around uh, expanding that and looking at applications and other assessment tools that might incorporate even uh, some authentic feedback using Flipgrid. So one of my favorite apps, you should take a look at it sometime if you wanna kinda geek out, is Flipgrid. So it allows a student to videotape a response that they have and, and uh, answer a question in a video response so you get some. And then there's some social emotional aspects to Flipgrid that are great that allows kids that wouldn't normally be open to that type of uh, engagement to be able to do so and, uh, and uh, participate in a classroom that the, other than that they wouldn't have felt uh, comfortable doing. So. So some great aspects there, a uh, ton of uh, sharing happening on Twitter around that. And so I'm super proud of the team and what they've done. 
That team's user activity, just to, I, I wanted to give a, a snapshot of what that looks like. So remember, we don't have students in yet, but just last week we had, in a set, this is a seven day period, over 15,000 channel messages, over 6,000 reply messages, 7,000 post messages, 78,000 chat messages. Um, we had over 5,100 meetings participated in and organized. We had 4,500 calls and 3,500, over 3,500 group calls. That is all of the things that would happen normally face-to-face -face in schools right now. And so all of that's happening virtually. That's, this is a great snapshot of where we're at as a society right now. And so we do have a question. Ernestine. Yeah, Ernestine. Um, one is that would you just reiterate that this setup that we have, that when a child has these devices in their home, that the home internet and their home computers cannot be hacked? Right. So we uh, we utilize. Um, uh, special, you know, standardized security in uh, Office 365. So their accounts are uh, under uh, A5 license, which allows us to have uh, for email, it's advanced threat protection. We also have what's called information rights management protection on that entire tenant. So that allows, uh, if I were to, let's say, use a, a social security number and I were to try to email that, and this happens a lot with some of our finance people where they might have a number that's inside of that email. It's gonna stop that immediately. And then also um, on the phishing side, whenever somebody's trying to fish your account, uh, we use uh, um, what's called cloud app security. It, it sets a level of artificial intelligence on top that just reacts faster than a person can react. So. Let's say somebody sent you a malicious uh, link or an email and you click on it, um, it's actually gonna redirect that to a ma malicious list that then if it identifies based upon not the list, but it's actually the pattern by which it's linked, and I might get a really technical right now, but. <laughs> We're beginning to get a What it here. does, it, it allows it to respond faster than a human can respond. So if I can mitigate that to one user and keep that from happening, then I also keep the rest of my team from having an issue. Right. So, yeah, there's, Next there's tons of stuff. I had was, yep. um, have the teachers had time to then create lessons with this stuff? Because one of the comments I've heard from a number of teachers is, I've got so much in my head, <laughs> I need time now to just figure out how to actually put my content in it. And uh, it, I just wanted to make sure, as far as you know, have the, uh, the different schools been allowing and encouraging teachers to use this to be able to, and then can, if they have questions, can they then get back to you yep. or someone so in your department? We were very purposeful in the technology trainings that we have. They are only the first half of the day, and the second half of the day is for reflection and practice. And so as long as that school building uh, allows that teacher to have that for reflection and practice, they would be practicing. Uh, a great example of that would be Stuckey Middle School. Shout out to Stuckey. They, they posted a YouTube video today of their reflections of teachers on a Padlet across the entire week that they had. And so those teachers created reflections, whether it be videos or artifacts, and uh, shout out to Stuckey. They, they did a great job of sharing out those reflections online. And I'll give you another example. There was a school that actually used each other's, uh, so there was two teams that got together and put themselves in a classroom and they practiced teaching um, with each other in that classroom with the kids in it, which were themselves in the class so that they can model with each other and get feedback and continue to learn that way. So I've seen a number of people also posting that and I thought that was a cool idea. So I thought I'd share that as well. Dr. Thompson, I would urge you to say again to principals, not fill up the spare time with more, even, even though we've got lots of important reasons why to have staff meetings at schools, 
don't do that. <laughs> I wrote that down. And I'm sure my friends up above did as well. <laughs> we, heard, we heard her. <laughs> we also have two more days of parent university that then those days would be open for those teachers as well. So that wouldn't have professional development. So Can I get on the time. parent university? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we will be posting. We, those videos were being translated today. And uh, they'll be posted in multiple translations here shortly. So you'll be able to see all. Uh, five sessions translated in multiple languages. Which brings me to the next and last question is that will any of the training sessions you did for teachers be available for them to look back at and see online? All of our trainings are recorded, yep, and posted. Super. Thank yep. you very much. Yep. Okay. I see no other questions, so continue. Thank you. Awesome. Next slide. So this is our planned device experience, and I say planned because um, we had, as many of you know, some changes that have happened in the availability of devices. So what I want to reiterate is this is still the plan that we're gonna do. And so no matter what uh, adjusted plan that I show you here uh, later, and, and some of this is, I, I don't wanna go back and forth with our slides, this is the plan that we'll be at once those devices come in and we'll begin to model that. What I love about this is um, when you look at uh, scaffolding student access, and I think about our uh, littles, our pre-K through K, those students do an, an inherent amount of computing uh, very well on a touch device, and an iPad fits them very well from the simplicity of an iPad. And so there's not a lot from a system standpoint that uh, a, a, a kid could get weary of in a remote learning environment on the iPad just because it's such a simplistic interface. Um, first through third, we'll be focusing on Chromebooks. And that's a, you know, basically a modern browser on a device and you get that browser experience. There's not an app that's actually loaded on that device. Everything's a web experience. Chromebooks, uh, it, it, some people thought that Teams doesn't work on a Chromebook. Teams does work on a Chromebook. Even Minecraft now, as of last week, works on a Chromebook. Um, might I add, it's not a great experience, but it works. And then uh, fourth and fifth grade, Windows 10 devices. So these Windows 10 devices, whenever I flip back to those Surface Pros that we did for those staff members, when we take their uh, device back, which is really about two years old now, we would repurpose those devices for fourth and fifth grade and those devices uh, would be a great experience for a student to have, but also would allow us to start to look at uh, whether it be STEM activities or uh, esports type activities, those types of things, on a much modern, more modern, more heavy computing device. And then secondary would be the HPs, in which we've tested many apps on. It's a higher level computing device, allowing you to do more t uh, higher level activities on than you would either a Chromebook or an iPad. So, HP? yeah, HP 440, that was the large purchase that you approved in April, March, May. So in the adjusted experience that you see here, what we're doing is we're supplying my school remote elementary, pre-K -K stays the same. My school remote elementary uh, would get devices in priority, and then six through 12, we decided to do by request, knowing that there's several students that already have technology. If I look at my own daughter, she's a senior this year. She, she has several devices. I mean, I, I, the kid has more devices than I've probably had over the life cycle of my device career, right? So um, when I, when I, look at that and that might allow us to provide a higher level computing device to the students that need it. So I say it in that way because I think there have been some misconceptions of, well, do we have enough devices? Well, we don't have enough devices for one-to-one -one across the entire board, but we have enough devices to support six through 12. And if it were planned out in a way that we could offer higher level computing devices, because remember, it's those Windows 10 higher level computing devices that I lack in. If I have the option for those students that already have a device that's a higher level computing device to select from, 
then I could offer that device to more students that need it and the availability is there. Those Chromebooks would then be distributed starting at middle school and working its way up to where we fit the need of my school remote. So when I think about it, I always go back to, it's really not about the device, but about what you want to do in learning. And then let me fit the, the um, requirements for that learning with a computing device. So many people say, well, what, what type of computing device are you gonna give me one? I go back to, so what is your learning experience? And then what are those requirements? And then let me fit the right computing device to that experience. And so when you look at um, my school remote elementary, those devices are a Chromebook. And when you shift into middle school, previously that would have been a Windows 10 device starting at fourth and fifth, remember in that previous model? But now we're extending those Chromebooks, which we've had, you know, I, I would look at a Chromebook device probably not as a, a long-term four-year-old device. It's more or less like uh, you're renting that device <laughs> over the course of three years and its viability of an experience is probably lessened in that fourth year just because of the nature of how content is delivered. So. We do have a question. Thank yep. Uh, yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. Um, say, for example, there's a family, multiple families out there that uh, opted into My School Remote um, from the get go, and they already have some device, at, a selection of devices at home, um, maybe even one that is the child's. Um, how, like, what kind of age slash capabilities of devices should parents that are, let's be honest, geeks like me, yep. um, what should we be looking for so we know when we check the, I don't need a device from the school district for now, save right. mine for a kiddo that needs it, that we're confident that the device that we have is going to be usable for the educational experience? So I would say four years old or less, because that's kind of the life cycle that I think about for a computing device. So if I were to think four years old or less, I would say four gigs of memory, right, of RAM. I would say at least 64 gig hard drive. Uh, 64 gig hard drive, at least four gigs of RAM. Um, I would say at least a 12 inch display that would allow them to uh, do an assessment or see content visibly enough to where they can complete uh, the types of content that will be delivered to them. And then just making sure it has a webcam, because remember we're having you know, tons of meetings. And so when you think about uh, just interacting, it's very much important to see the other person. Okay, that answers it, thank you. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, right now, we've got technology on back order. <clears throat> And we have asked our parents, and there is a lot of confusion out there about why they're asking me when they're supposed to give us one. But it's simply because if they have something that's good enough for their students to use, meets the requirements, if they can, if they can be willing to use their machine short term, eventually we will have technology for Absolutely. them. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Uh, today we have 8,152 of those HPs of the 24,000 are in our hands and are ready to be deployed. So we've received uh, around 8,000 bags last Friday. Should be 8,000 bags arriving today or tomorrow. So those are bags that we would just put devices into. And then another 8,000 bags next Monday. And then uh, September 5th is scheduled for another shipment of 2,000 of those HPs should leave China. So then at that time, uh, we could, depend upon what the timeline is on those devices coming in, we could supplement what's there, right, at the high school level, or even shift those to middle school. And then sometime uh, around uh, uh, 45 days or so, we should receive a bulk shipment of around 12,000. That's currently what that cycle looks like. And then the rest would come following weeks after that. Yeah. So. And the reason for this is supply and demand. Um, supply and demand, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, you think about today, uh, 
I, I'm sure several of us have bought from Amazon and you're not guaranteed the two day, you know, at least since before March. And so uh, just looking at supply chains have all changed kind of how we interact as a society and how we buy things. I mean, I remember the last time I went to Sam's Club and I saw a full shelf of toilet paper was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so you look at just that availability, it's the same. And even uh, there are some uh, political issues around some uh, embargoes that have also made things challenging from that standpoint as well. Okay. But just to reassure our public, we are going to have enough technology to start school for everybody who needs it. Yes. And we will have enough technology for everybody, hopefully by the end of the year or as soon as we possibly can get it in. Because we've ordered it, it's coming, we're, we're working to get it out as quickly as we get it. Yes. Okay. We're working to procure uh, just some staffing right now to help us because we, in this model, we were already distributing these devices. If you look at these two models, the older de machines from high school, middle school to elementary, well, we, we mostly did that. And then now we're shifting to move all those back. So, uh, so there's a lot of manpower effort that's happening around this. And also, um, when you look at that top tier and you see Seesaw and Microsoft Teams, so Seesaw is something that I'm asking you to approve tonight. And what it is is uh, a simplified assignment interface. So whenever I think about um, assignments, and you think about the assignments that middle school, high school kids do, uh, those assignments, uh, usually there's like an artifact, you have a document. Well, today that's very much a, a very advanced process. And what Seesaw allows is a more simplified process for pre-K through two that could complete an assignment and they could either take a picture of that assignment um, there's also a parent engagement piece of that. So if I'm a kindergarten parent and I want to see what my child uh, handed in today, I could, I could have an interface to see that. So there's an engagement piece there. But the basis for it is just that it's a simpler assignment interface, and we would be integrating that into Microsoft Teams. Also above that, you see that we're also looking at a support model for this approach. So I equate a, a password reset last year as something that a student would just tell their teacher, I can't get into my machine. Teacher would then call the STS down and fix that. That whole process isn't there anymore, right? When you think about that student, if they can't get into that account, it's as if they were locked out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so from a grass level standpoint, we've got to think about how we can be empathetic toward that family and that level of a problem has now escalated because I can't, as a student, I can't do anything until that's resolved. And so normally I'd be able to participate in other hands-on activities, but I don't have that luxury anymore with that. And so, um, so we're looking at that, looking at even how we utilize our, our help desk and create some menus that then still bring STSs engaged at the building into it because we realize that our help desk doesn't know everything about the specifics of a building. And so how do we incorporate the nature of keeping buildings and their availability to do things autonomously, and but still make sure that we're providing support and not accidentally sending, you know, uh, uh, a parent or a student on a bird walk just because we're, our awareness level is low in that area, so. Ernestine? Well, that brings me, going back to Ben's question about families that are gonna use their devices that they already own, can Seesaw and all of these other things you're talking about be put on those home devices and be just as safe? Yes, they're just web-based applications. Uh, okay. There's not, not an installation to Seesaw whatsoever, so. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, I see no more questions, so continue, please. Uh, next slide. So when you look at um, how we're going to gather information and check out devices, so we have a student parent form that I'll talk a little bit about when we get down to the policy area. Dr. Thompson will call me up uh, to discuss that just very briefly, but that form will go to a bunch of lists. And so how we do 
Uh, if any of you did a student special transfer process this year, we, we completely made that automated. And so it's the same process that we did for that will be the same uh, solution that we use for here. And in that list, we'll identify the device serial and the MiFi serial, and we're working with our STSs to be able to do that at rollout. So in the end of this, we will have a complete mapping of what devices that we've rolled out so that then when it's time and we get more devices in and we want to swap that, we can just contact that family and say, hey, we have on this list that you have this device. Why don't you either come in or be swapped with another device that's a higher level computing device. So we'll have all that information. Any questions on any of that? Are you gonna address the actual rollout, how that's gonna happen? Yeah, so um, when you look at uh, the rollout today, there are different provisions that we're going to be putting out. So uh, HP will be handled by RTI and we're, uh, that's the company that we purchased those through and so They'll be bagging those devices for us, and as they come in, they'll help us deploy those devices. Those HP devices will have a built-in SIM card, and then we can activate that SIM card if that student has identified that they need internet. And so those devices will be internet ready and ready to go. At the middle school level, there's a slight shift because um, no longer do we have those HP devices as of yet for those students. So. If I'm a family and I have a middle school and an elementary student, I'll be provided a MiFi because that MiFi, I brought my props. That MiFi device, this device supports 15 students or 15 devices. Uh, and so I would supply that device to that family that would then support, if you have three students, four students, it would supply that and we would just record the serial number off of this MiFi. This MiFi uh, also, does the filtering on the MiFi, so if I have a personal device that connects to this, it would still be filtered. Um, but also on top of that, if it's a district-owned device, we're utilizing a filtering solution that's cloud-based that would filter that device as well, whether it's connected to that device or not. So that shift will allow us to, to deploy Chromebooks and utilize iPads that then would be provided a MiFi device to those middle and elementary school students. And then uh, we're working with those buildings to identify their schedule for that. Um, looking at some of our high schools would begin to, de to deploy August 31. I'm working with the other schools to identify when their start date is for that. And so, uh, but when you look at uh, a school such as East High, it's gonna take multiple days to roll out. And you think about social distancing, you think about uh, on the Windows 10 devices we actually need uh, a specific amount of time that I have the student once they've logged in to deploy some large pieces of software so I'm not using a home internet software to deploy that software so uh, that is specific to those devices and so we'll have uh, some uh, videos for those students to watch that would have them go through some digital literacy how to take care of the machine all those things that they'll be watching while that software is loading on the back end as well as digital literacy and courseware for elementary and middle school students. Not because I need to hold them captive for that time, but just because they need access to those courses prior to, to having that device. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I, I do have just one other, because they will actually pick the devices up at school. Correct. But on a schedule, so they just don't go in they will be assigned a time, come in, that way we can help do the social distancing and everything else yes. we need to do. So they will, they should expect in the next week or so to get a, a message from the school telling them when to come to get the devices, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Email, so we now have pre-K through 12 email. Um, Pre-K through five can only send inside of the district. And then uh, middle school and high school can both receive email and send email. And so if a student in enrollment, or the parent actually that enrolled the student, has entered preferred name into the preferred name field, preferred name takes priority and becomes the student's email address. 
Now that student can log in to that account still using their student ID at usd259.net address. However, their email address that they send from will be their first name dot last name at students.usd259.net. And also, we've uh, categorized a parentheses next to the display name to say student, whether the email is sent inside or outside the district, so you'll know that it is a student. Any questions on that? And we're also using advanced threat protection uh, to where it's the same on top of that as it is Microsoft Teams to where uh, bullying, uh, uh, language, all those other things are covered underneath that and notify the appropriate folks whenever those are uh, messages happen. Next slide. One of the biggest pieces, the reason why for email is because uh, inside of Teams, so because we didn't have email in the spring, those students didn't have calendar inside of Teams. So if you scheduled an appointment with them, they would have had to have written that down for them to know to have gone into that Teams meeting. And so now, uh, going into Teams, they have the calendar icon and can now click on that to then see not only those meetings that that teacher identifies, but also the uh, assignments and when those assignments are due on that calendar. And so all of that's integrated. Um, looking at this slide with Teams integration, we're working, uh, actually I have a phone call on Wednesday to start the process for school data sync and also um, rostering all of our uh, classrooms into Teams. So uh, Synergy and, and Teams talk to each other. We're also looking at grade write back. So if I have an assignment that's provisioned in Teams, student takes that assignment and it's graded or auto graded based upon if it was an auto graded quiz, that grade would come right back into Synergy without that teacher having to do it. it. Yes. It goes directly to the student and then goes right back into Synergy to where that parent could see that once it's posted inside of Synergy. Uh, next slide. Um, this is our software adoption form. This is a power app that my staff built. Um, it got released today, so this would allow teachers, if they want to use a piece of software that's not currently on the approved list, this is an automated way to run that through. I uh, posted that yesterday. They come live today, and I think we have, I have several requests in there already. So, uh, so it's definitely being utilized and uh, We'll output to a dashboard later that I will show uh, that will give by content area and by grade level the available software. So we have a new teacher hire, all they have to do is go to the dashboard, click on a grade level, click on a content area, hey, here's all the software that's approved for use. And next slide is just uh, to see if you'll make a motion to approve Seesaw. Any other questions? for me? We do have some. Mike? Yeah, I'm looking at this and we're approving Seesaw for three years for pre-K to, to two. How many students are we talking about a year? Uh, so it's a little over 10,000 students. So we're paying $33,000 a student or a year for yep. 2,000 students? Three, it should be around $3. I want to, so it'd be six dollars the first year and isn't then, that two thousand per grade level that's not total pre-k two is two thousand kids is it pre-k through two is a little over ten thousand kids oh ten thousand i'm sorry yeah. i misunderstood sorry. and thought you said two thousand i'm sorry sorry okay pre-k through two is about ten thousand didn't realize we had that many kids in pre-k and two so we just uh purchased around 18 or 1900 ipads for pre-k so just kind of give you a idea okay uh, Ron yes I was just want to find out on this sticker here uh, is there a drop box for that or, and how, yeah how that so uh, I, I put I put that sticker because that's the sticker that will go on the bottom edge of the devices and uh, you'll notice if you try to peel it, it it doesn't peel off very well or very easy and it actually breaks apart but all of our devices, no matter if they're that iPad, that Chromebook, or that Windows 10 device, are what's called hardware hashed into the system. So if uh, somebody were to try to wipe that device, 
it will re-enroll itself the moment it touches the internet back into our system and then notify us. So then, you know, basically we could brick that device or identify its location if it has a cell signal. How about if uh, it's lost? So if it's lost uh, and it's still got the software on it, the moment it touches the internet in some way, we will get notified. Be able to locate it. Yep. Okay. If it has a cellular signal on an internet connection, I can, I can try to locate, but it's based upon the internet location. If mm -hmm. it's a cellular based device, I could get probably within about six feet. Okay. So. All right, thank you. B ben? Oh, Ernestine, you wanna go first? Well, mine is just simple. What happens if a child, if one gets broken, it gets caught under the roller of the chair and gets crushed? Yep, so uh, we have, um, for those HP devices that we purchased, so 24,000, those have accidental coverage on them. Um, on the other devices, it's dependent upon what was purchased at that time. So that's part of the messiness about ha not having a device rollout uh, plan is that not everything's uniform. But you'll see later as we look at the parent-student uh, engagement, we're putting some provisions in that would allow a voluntary insurance that a parent could do that then if that device was lost or stolen, uh, it would be covered. Right. And, but presumably if it happens and the child's in the middle of lessons, we could replace that so they weren't left out of school. So would definitely say. swap that device, yeah. correct. Ben? Um, so uh, first is a, is a comment. Um, so this coming school year, if any 259 employees receive an email from uh, Blankly, um, it might be me. It might, <laughs> it might be, it might be with a five-year-old. Um, and then uh, I move that uh, we uh, approve the seesaw agreement proposal. Okay. Ernestine Crapel, I second it. Okay, it's been moved by Ben Blankley and seconded by Ernestine Crable that we approve the Seesaw uh, software. I'm seeing no other questions, so would you please cast your votes? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much, Rob. You. School is going to look very different this year. <laughs> Thank you. Next item, Mike. Consent. All right. Uh, ben, do you have anything to pull from the consent agenda? Uh, ben Blankley, District 1, I do not. Okay. Ernestine? Ernestine Crable, District 3, I do not. Julie? Um, I'll pull E1, Yoida, for August 10 and August 20. Okay. Uh, I have nothing to pull. Cheryl Logan, at large. Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, I have none. Stan Reeser, District 4, no consent items to pull. Ron Rosales, District 6, nothing. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the rest of the agenda except for E1? Ben Blankley, District 1, I move we approve the rest of the consent agenda except for E1. Second. Okay, I see no comments, so would you please cast your votes to approve the consent agenda except for that one item. Motion passes 7-0. Uh, Julie, uh, item E1 on the meeting minutes. Yeah, and um, I apologize to Dr. Mike because normally if I have a correction on the minutes, I, uh, I let him know ahead of time. But um, Cheryl and I were having a conversation and we had a little bit different recollection. Um, so I'm assuming you take these minutes directly out of the recorded session. Is that, is that correct? I watched the entire meeting on Friday. You watched the entire meeting and just took the notes off of that. Yes. So, um, so even though Ernestine and I had a little bit different recollection about, um, oh, it's actually shows on page six of six, and um, and um, we're talking about the gating level restrictions, and we said that. Um, we would be at our current level for the first nine weeks unless the COVID-19 advisory committee recommends movement of either direction 
with the minimum being five weeks. So I just, I, I think it's, that's what I heard on the, on the meeting also. Um, so I don't have a change to recommend. I'm just wanting to review that it, that that's what we said was nine weeks with a minimum of five weeks. So. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna make a motion that um, E1 um, be approved as uh, the minutes are approved as published. Is there a second? Ron Rosales, District 6. Okay, yes. it was moved second. by Julie and seconded by Ron Rosales to approve E1 in the minutes, the BOE minutes. Please cast your vote. Motion passed 7 0. Thank you. Next item, Mike. Under policy, proposed revisions to BOE policy 1230, acceptable device and communication use by staff, students, and the district, and deletion of P1230A, excess and acceptable use contract. On March 30th, 2020, the board approved new BOE policy 1230, acceptable device and communication use by staff, students, and the district. As part of the consolidation of several technology policies, the board also approved new P1230A access and acceptable use contract. This agenda item provides for the addition of AIP 10 to P1230 regarding the loan of technology devices to students and proposes deletion of P1230A access and acceptable use contract because the specific language of such agreements is changed from time to time and it is unnecessary to adopt the agreement itself as a policy. The district is preparing to distribute technology to students in the immediate future and it is recommended that the board approve these policy revisions in one review. On March 30th, 2020, the board also approved a revision to BOE policy 0100, organization and functions of the board which addresses the board's function of adopting and or reviewing policies in AIP 4 of that policy 0100. The board approved a revision to AIP 4 that provides during an emergency, the board may approve a new policy or major content revisions to existing policies after a single review in the policy section of the BOE agenda. Therefore, it is recommended the board approve the proposed revisions to BOE policy 1230 and deletion of 1230A under the provision of BOE policy 0100 for one review of the policy. Okay, again, this is coming before us because we need this policy to change in order to roll out our computers to our kids. And so there's not enough time for us to have two meetings on this. We need to do it so we can get computers in kids' hands. Uh, I'm seeing no questions. Is there a, a motion for adoption? I move for adoption of this. Stan Research District 4, second. Okay, Ernestine Crable uh, made the motion to adopt this uh, policy change and Stan Research seconded. Uh -huh. Would you please cast your vote? Motion passes 7-0. Now we can get those computers in students' hands. Thank you. Next item. Under operations, 2020-21 nutrition services plan for students attending school remotely. Tonight's presentation will include an update on the district's plan to provide food services to students who attend school remotely in the 2020-21 school year. This item provides an opportunity for the board's information and discussion. Good evening. Good evening. We've had lots of questions about are we going to provide food for kids, so I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, we are tag teaming it, so you're going to get, from, you're going to get us from both sides. Um, good Stereo. afternoon, uh, President Logan, <laughs> Vice President Hedrick, Dr. Thompson, members of the board. Uh, David and I are here today to talk about our plan for remote feeding of students uh, or feeding remote students uh, through uh, the period that we remain on this orange and while we continue with, with um, um, remote, offering remote services. Um, I want to first of all give kudos to the rest of our nutrition services leadership team who have worked incredibly hard to develop this plan. 
Uh, we've sat through many a meetings, and this, this project has been a labor of love as their operation is very large and very heavily regulated. And because of that, coming up with the, the proper plan that's gonna allow us to both continue to serve on-site and then continue and then serve, offer this remote offering has taken quite a bit of planning. Um, so as we begin, uh, we talk a little bit about, about uh, the background. Uh, Governor Kelly announced the closing of schools uh, for the remainder of the school year on March 17th. At that point, uh, we begin working on developing a plan to continue serving students in our community. Um, as a part of that, uh, we begin providing meals to students at 18 sites uh, with uh, twice a week distribution uh, using the USDA's or US Department of Ag Agriculture's summer food service program. Uh, the congregate feeding requirement was waived at that point. That meant that we could feed students um, and provide meals to students, but they don't have to necessarily eat on site if that is the case. Uh, in total, we served over 480,000 meals uh, between March and May. We averaged just over 11,000 meals a day. The number of sites then was reduced on June 1st. This is uh, typical of nutrition services. As you know, we shorten staff and we lower staff in the summertime uh, in order for us to be able to, to provide. So we took the number of sites down to nine. Uh, at that point, uh, we've uh, served around 5,500 meals a day is what we've been averaging since then. Um, meal service will continue through September the 2nd. I think your sheet says uh, August 31st. The USDA just extended uh, the, the summer food program, non-congregate feeding, and so we are able to continue to serve through next week, and so we intend to do that until uh, regulations change. I will tell you, though, that starting next week, we will be, or starting on September the 8th, we will be transitioning uh, from the summer food program and the guidelines that we've been serving under to the national school lunch program and the school breakfast program. And Dave is gonna talk a little bit about the differences between both programs. That's hopefully going to help our public understand a little bit more about why some of the changes that are gonna be occurring because the program is gonna look very different than what it's looked like the last few months. Uh, next slide, please. So again, as Fabian stated in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some comparisons or differences between the summer food service program and the national school lunch and school breakfast programs. So under the summer food service program, we use area eligibility to qualify sites for free meals. And so 50% of those in that service area need to qualify for free meals during the school year. Uh, whereas in uh, our plan coming up, uh, when school starts on September 8th, students must be charged based on their benefit issuance level uh, from either direct certification or free, their free and reduced meal application. So in other words, they'll be charged the free or reduced or paid rates. And so during the summer, all students eat for free. And during the school year, they don't. We, we all know that um, students are, are claimed, their meal, the meals that we served are claimed based on their uh, eligibility status. And for the summer, uh, any child can eat ages one through 18, whereas um, in our, my remote plan that we'll be implementing, students must be enrolled in the district uh, on site or my remote. Next slide, please. So from March through August, USDA allowed for non-congregate feeding. So basically, don't, students don't have to eat together in the same location or room. And as Fabian said, they can, they can eat off-site. Um, the summer food service program is traditionally a serve program so that children receive all of the food groups for each meal. Um, and under the National School Lunch and Breakfast Program, we're allowed to do an offer program which allows students to make some choices and take three to five items. So we always encourage them to take all their fruits and vegetables, but if they want to refuse those, they are allowed to. And that also helps us to minimize waste, which is gonna be really important in these trying times. And under the Summer Food Service Program, the waiver allows for multiple days worth of meals, so 
we can serve up to seven days of meals, and we've actually been doing that for several weeks now. Um, we, we've kind of, since this is all new to us, we're kind of phasing in in steps and then trying to grow the program. Uh, and under the school year program, we're only going to be allowed to serve five days worth of meals. So again, breakfast and lunch. Next slide, please. Uh, under the summer food service program, generally students are required to be present to, to receive meals. And we are going to, uh, for the coming school year beginning September 8th, parents are going to be able to pick up meals on behalf of the students. Um, we have to have systems in place to protect the integrity of the meal program. And our plan is actually five typed pages that we submitted to KSDE uh, late last week. We have a call with the director from KSDE Child Nutrition. And basically what we're, what we're hoping we can do is to claim all those meals under one site or worst case scenario, the five sites that we're actually going to be serving at, as opposed to what um, KSE would like us to do, which is claim those meals at the site that the student is enrolled in. So we might have a child eat at Chester Lewis, but they actually go to Mueller. So um, I, I'm only imagining the amount of time that's going to take to claim those students under their enrolled school. Next slide, please. So under the summer food service program, the point of sale is really quick and easy. We use a roster. Uh, no, we don't use a roster at all. That would be for the 2021 school year. Actually, for the summer food service program, all we have to do is put a check mark in a box as kids come through and pick up their meal. Uh, the point of service has to be at the end of the serving line. It's really quick. It's easy. It's simple. Uh, under the school year because we're going to be uh, counting and claiming those student meals under their correct eligibility status. We're going to have to get their names. We're going to have to verify that they're enrolled. And so it's going to be a more time consuming process for our customers that are going to be coming to pick up meals. Next slide, please. And under the summer food service program, it's the same meal pattern for all age groups. Uh, whereas under the school lunch and breakfast program, the meal pattern will vary by age group. There's additional whole grain rich requirements. There's, a different, there's additional requirements for vegetable subgroups. I'll, sh I'll share that. You'll see an example of that um, in, a, in the next couple of slides. Uh, additional requirements by age group, such as the number of calories that we have to offer and provide. And so when I'm talking about vegetable subgroups, we have to provide green leafy vegetables, legumes, beans, uh, red, yellow, orange vegetables, that's another group, and then starchy vegetables such as peas and corn and potatoes. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, once we begin school on September the 8th, uh, we will begin to operate under the National School Lunch and Breakfast Programs, uh, which are regulated differently. And I think that's what our, our public needs to understand is because it's a different program. There are different requirements tied to it, so it will not be the same. Every student enrolled on site or remote will have access to school breakfast and lunches, so they'll have access to one of those a day. Students are able to receive one reimbursable breakfast and one lunch per day. That's varied on their status, free, reduced, or paid. Um, and then additional meals would be charged at the daily visitor rates. Uh, so and the visitor rates are $225 for breakfast and $395 for lunch. Uh, another point of clarification here is that virtual students or education imagined students are not eligible to participate in school meal programs because they are attending a virtual school, but they may purchase meals at, at the visitor rate if they want. And that visitor rate is around $31 a week uh, for the meals that, that we're serving. And again, our goal is to serve the students that will order the meals, uh, regardless of status, um, we're hoping that the, the type of meals that we're offering will be attractive to families that maybe get a reduced meal or that potentially would even want to pay for the meal. So again, again our goal would be to, to attract as many people that would come to our point 
of, of distribution areas and, and get a, a week's worth of meals. Next slide, please. So uh, tomorrow we will be sending out a survey to parents to get an idea as to uh, what they might be looking for, where they, where they might go, how far would they travel to pick up meals and try to gather some information from the parents. And um, then we're going to have service that's gonna be provided through an online ordering system. And the first online orders are gonna be due on September 3rd, and that will give us a week to prepare and stage and get um, meals sent to our sites. And meal delivery will occur from 5 to 6 p.m. every Thursday evening starting September 10th at the following sites. So Chester Lewis, West High School, North High School, Enterprise, and AMAC slash Curtis. And so the survey is gonna gauge participation, hopefully, so we can uh, purchase the right amount of food and determine our, our staffing and other needs. Uh, evening distribution once a week would hopefully allow parents the opportunity to come get meals. Nutrition services will do a waiver to allow parents to pick up meals without their students being present. Having a pickup time during the middle of the day may decrease the number of families who could participate. Uh, one pickup a week will also ease the burden on families. A Thursday pickup allows for the food production center to produce the boxes and for us to get product out to our um, sites and storage areas. And it, it will allow us to kind of clear out our coolers for over the weekend because we don't want food to be sitting for you know, four and five days. Uh, next slide, please. And again, if you look at the locations of the side, we try to be strategic in terms of covering every area of our city um, and putting also a location in the assigned attendance area or AAA also. So we try to make that. They, and, and the meals that they'd be picking would be obviously five, five days worth of meals, five breakfasts and five lunch that would come together. Um, so, so that's another change there. Um, so uh, point of service, uh, nutrition services will, will use paper rosters uh, for students' names on it. Again, we chose the, the survey request meals in advance uh, way to do this because we felt it would, be, it would allow us to better prepare uh, with all of the students that are uh, studying remotely now or are getting their learning remote, they would have already access to a device that they could fill out the survey and request the meals in advance for. So that was part of the reasoning behind that. And we will be working uh, once that, that we, we have that survey developed, it'll go out and we can send parent links out via uh, text message because they could be able to order via a smart device. Uh, so th it'll, be, it'll be fairly easy to use to do the ordering. Uh, rosters of students whose families ordered meals uh, will be used uh, for that roster. Uh, family, a family that visits the site uh, that did not pre-order will have to validate the students. So if someone didn't pre-order, we will have some extra meals available. Uh, but again, they'll be available upon request. It can't be that many. And so those families will take a little bit longer to go through the process because we're gonna have to validate the students. Uh, meals will be served from the nutrition services de delivery tracks. Uh, families would receive a bag of protein, uh, grain, vegetable components, and uh, the option to select fruit and milk. And again, I, this, this distribution, it, I, I think, allows us to, to kind of better serve our community in some ways, and also the pre-ordering piece will allow us to be better prepare, prepared in, in minimized ways as, as much as possible, too. Next slide, please. So, um, as you can imagine, the, the service of breakfast and lunch will be a little bit more in a bulk fashion, so we're not going to stage and, and bag and tag a breakfast and a lunch and then put three breakfasts and lunch in another bag. Um, that, that should hopefully help us uh, with productivity and getting the meals together. And then I've just shown you a sample of a K-8 menu where um, you'll pick up breakfast grains, so five portions of those. Uh, we'll actually provide um, a number 10 can of fruit, and so that would be enough fruit for breakfast and lunch for an entire week. Uh, five portions of sliced turkey, five buns, and then vegetables, there you see your subgroups there, so we'll have to wa 
offer broccoli, which is our green slash leafy vegetable, baby carrots, which is the red, yellow, orange, uh, beans, which is our legumes, corn, starchy. And then we're, we're gonna actually, um, we're working with the dairy now to provide half gallons of milk along with half pints so that we don't have to count out so many half, half pints for every meal period. Uh, and we're already kind of, as, as a team, working on and talking about some you know, ways that we can lo look at it beyond the first two weeks of doing this so we can perhaps, off, perhaps offer um, some additional variety um, and maybe take another look at our sites as well. And I believe that's... Next oh, slide. Got one more. Next slide, please. <laughs> And again, our plan will be to work with strategic communications, uh, to work on informing parents, making the survey and the request form available out uh, to as many families as possible, pulling that information from Synergy and being able to target our remote families. The other piece that the, uh, the advanced ordering will allow us to do is if a student will have the order forms in advance that we'll be able to look at. So if a student has requested a meal, but they perhaps haven't uh, filled out a free and reduced uh, uh, meals benefit form, we will be able to contact them and say, hey, we received your order form. Uh, you haven't filled out the form yet. Um, it's available out there, so it'll allow us to be able to have uh, some of those discussions once, when we know who the families are that are requesting this in advance. Uh, we will have a need for potential additional security, and we're already working with uh, Terry Moses and her team about this. And I will say I gotta give them credit because they've been more than gracious with us throughout this entire time that we've been serving. They've had security out every time. And in many instances where we've been short of people, they've been out there bagging food for us too. So they've been really gracious. And also the building principles of the sites that we've ran this whole time because they have also assisted in, in many ways. So a big thank you to them and their staff that have helped us. Um, we will need pivot time in order for us to transition meal services from where we are in the current orange level. If we are going to the red and we're going full remote, then we'll need to make some changes. Uh, again, the opposite way, if we're going to the yellow, we'll need some additional pivot time in order for us to be able to transition. And, and hopefully I will work with the committee, Dr. Thompson's aware, uh, to make them aware of what that pivot time is because we will need to be able to transition. Uh, again, the, 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 the food supply chain, as you all know, is very challenging right now and we need to order food with plenty in advance, the meal items that we're talking about serving for remote are very different than some of the ingredients that we need for our everyday on site. And so we need that pivot time in order for us to get the necessary food for us to be ready for when students return back. So I will say that that is, that is a consideration. And again, we'll continue to assess the, the needs of the program and make adjustments. Um, we've talked and, and David's team has brainstormed and dreamed big. And so we, we, once we get going, we get started, we continue, then we're looking at potentially looking at uh, changing the number of sites. Uh, also, we've, we've talked about the possibility of maybe using our transportation system to do some sort of meal delivery, uh, if we can do that. Uh, and then uh, obviously some menu modifications too. So this is the beginning. We're hoping as we get going that we're able to expand and make some tweaks as needed and as we see uh, the need in our community uh, shift. So that's all we have. Next slide, questions? We have some questions for you, Ben. Yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. Um, I wanna say my family has been participating in the meal pickups every week since we started in, uh, in March. Um, and we've been exceptionally pleased with the level of service and the quality of the food and, and the, it, you know, it's a slight inconvenience in the middle of my work day to come. So this shifting mm -hmm. in, in, in service time is going to be exceptionally important um, for people in my odd situation of working from home full time. Um, so uh, we will be opting into weekly service personally. Um, uh, so my question in terms of that is, uh, this is an assumption on my part, and I wanted to verify, will we be using the same Titan K-12 payment, prepayment system that we would be using during the normal service time? Uh, yes and no. We're gonna um, be using a roster. Well, <laughs> just being honest, but, Dr. Thompson. But I, you'll be able to put money into your account using the same Titan system that we're utilizing. Yeah. So we'll be using Titan, but we'll be entering our rosters into the system the next day. Okay. So right. your account 
uh, won't reflect your sales or purchases until the next day. Okay. Um, so, in, uh, Fabian, you mentioned uh, we'd be looking at possibly uh, food delivery to specific families in need, kind of, sort of like what we did in partnership with the Kansas Food Bank earlier in the summer slash spring? Um, I don't know that we did any direct deliveries. That was done with the Kansas Food Bank. Uh, Terrell Davis is there. Yeah, yeah, that was another project. We just partnered with another group that had a combination. They had some relationships with the food bank and then we just combined the two and was able to deliver uh, the combination okay. that way. So that was a partnership. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question I had is, uh, so um, we've been serving uh, one hot item with every pickup so far. Um, will we, because the service time is changed, um, is that going to change or is that is there going, I mean, it's a new program. It, it really can't be compared to the summer food program. So can you explain like hot and cold item mix in the plans? Uh, I can, how about if I provide a menu to the board, would that be helpful? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that would be helpful, yeah. Um, I, I think that would more likely be another phase of the program. Uh, we are looking, however, for uh, our second week to uh, do like taco meat or, or pork carnita meat. So there will be some hot items. Um, the state of Kansas, unfortunately, has um, imposed some limitations on us. So we have to take a completely cooked product that's for at the manufacturers, which is then cooled and frozen. We have to take that product and thaw, cook, chill. So in other words, taking take it through the food danger zone another two or three times and then provide it to the family with instructions. Not all states are doing that. There are a few that are. Interesting. Um, and my last question is, how big is a number 10 can? Uh, a number 10 can will provide approximately 20 half cup servings. So like it's, 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 it's hefty. Mm. Round, mm. tall. Okay. About five pounds. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Cheryl Logan uh, with the at-large. Um, when do you anticipate that we might hear about the waiver that you've submitted to KSDE? Uh, we're going to have a conversation with uh, Cheryl Johnson tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. So we should know fairly quickly if we can do what we want to do. Yes, okay. ma'am. Second thing is, as I understand it, our parents sign up for free and reduced lunch if they're eligible, but they can buy food if they don't. And, and then they pre-order, they put an order in saying, I'm gonna go to Lewis to pick up my food. Mm -hmm. And you qualify them through that pre-order, correct? Correct. And then I assume they bring some kind of identification with them? Yeah, that, that's all part of our plan. Um, okay, it, as long as they do that, that was <laughs> just my question. Then, then they will get at, on this Thursday night from five to six, they will get enough food for one child that will last a week. And if they have multiple kids, they'll get enough food for every child that yes. will last for five days. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, how much pivot time are you talking about? Because we've kind of talked about giving parents two weeks notice. Is that enough pivot time for our nutrition service? It, that's really hard for us to commit to right now. It, it really almost depends on the menu day, what we're serving today, what we're serving mm -hmm. in a week, what we're I, serving in two weeks, and what kind of inventory we have on hand right yeah. now. Um, we're putting a big focus in on making sure that we aren't uh, having to donate or discard any food items um, because Financially, as I think Susan mentioned, we're going to have some challenges as it is. So we are watching every penny. And Cheryl, just to answer your question, I, I think if we're pivoting from the orange to the red, two weeks is probably ample time. If we're pivoting from the, from the orange to yellow, we might need a little bit more time to get the food in that we need. And again, with, with, with the financial situation that nutrition services, uh, the challenges that we're facing with, with serving less meals, um, 
we are being uh, smart about our food ordering because we don't want to incur very much weight. And so because of the food supply chain, again, we'd probably need a little bit more time to pivot into more students coming back on site and also to give their operation, we're talking about 50,000 meals being made a day, uh, an opportunity to return back to the same, uh, the same way that they operated prior, so. Yeah. And, and that becomes an important piece because we don't want kids arriving back on site and not having food. Exactly. Okay. Um, Ron? Yes. Um, I was just wanting to find out with the um, USDA, since this is federally funded, um, has there been any, uh, I guess, like complications or any um, difficulties as far as opening remote and opening on site because some people had heard you know that there might be some federal funding that would be withheld and if schools don't go uh, full on site versus remote and so on and so forth is there anything out there that you know uh, parents ought to be concerned about as far as any money being withheld to uh, schools for opening up in our, in in, our case I, half half and half i i would do want to make a clarification because i think it goes it ties back to the budget a discussion that we've had earlier. I think there, there is a misconception out there, and we've had presentations actually where we discussed how the Nutrition Services Fund works. You know, their funding comes from the meals that they serve. Mm -hmm. And so last spring, when we shut down schools, as you can see, 11,000 meals a day is great, but they typically serve 50,000 meals a day. So they get reimbursement for 50,000 meals a day, typically. Well, we are only getting reimbursement for 11,000 meals a day but we were still incurring staffing at the same levels, and we had to order some different food items mm -hmm. for, the, for the feeding that we've been doing. And so because of that, again, the, the reimbursement hasn't been enough for us to be able to even break even uh, during the spring. And I think that's a big part of the challenge that we're facing is, again, we're not serving enough meals, but we've been staffing at the same levels uh, and so that's created a challenge and a, and a hole in the nutrition services budget. I guess it's all complicated, but I, I'm just thinking, you know, is, is there anything from the USDA stating that, hey, you guys are uh, not opening um, on, on site, so therefore we're going to, you know, mess around with your money? None of that's... Not, not to my knowledge. Okay, no. okay. Yeah, I just heard, and I, I just wanted to make sure we're all clear on that. Yeah, and again, we're all actually hoping that they extend the summer food service program to the end of the school year so everyone can eat for free. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you. That, that's what we're lobbying for. <laughs> all right. Julie? Yeah. Julie? Um, you've given a lot of great information tonight and a lot of it de pretty detailed, actually. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, if a parent is confused about how meal service is going to work, um, how do they find out? Do you have something on the USD 259 uh, website that's just kind of a down and dirty simplified version of here's we'll, we'll what be, to We'll expect. be working on that tomorrow morning, ma'am. Okay, and, um, great. And, and they can contact us via phone or email our nutrition. In the meantime, email. if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Ernestine? concerned about the parents and the families that don't have transportation and in limiting it to these sites uh, some other school districts in the nation and some parents have contacted me have said why not use the school buses to deliver on the route that they go to or like a, a particular site on a route where families or even the kids themselves could come and pick up the things I really am very concerned because there are problems with people that don't have wheels at five to six in the evening to come and pick those things up. Have we thought about the using the buses and the bus route? And f tell us your pros and cons on that and how you had up. We, we actually, we've, we've talked about it in great detail and that's something that we will be exploring from a routing standpoint. I think that's part of what I, we're hoping some of the survey will, will get us back. There are some challenges with point of sale, obviously, and making sure that we're verifying that the student, the meals that, that, we're, that we're distributing go to the appropriate students, all of those pieces. Again, our, that is 
our next phase, our next step, is to explore how we can leverage our transportation system to be able to help a little bit with some of that. Right now, because we are not running buses for our first and second tier, or not running the same number of buses, I should say, I think we have a little bit of leverage to be able to utilize that. So that is something that's coming down the pike. We just need to kind of work through the details and the routing uh, to make sure that we are doing it efficiently um, as, as, we're, as we work through that. So at this point, it's left that families just have to find a way to get to those particular sites. Uh, I, Stan, is, is your district go clear down to the south? I'm concerned about the particular south part of that there doesn't seem to be a site real far south. Enterprise Elementary, I believe. Is that far enough to pick up down that southern area? Yeah, Enterprise, Stan Research District 4, Enterprise is basically at 235 in South Seneca, and that's okay. kind of a centralized location yeah. to the south okay. side, so Enterprise should work. Yeah, I, I just, mean, it's not perfect, but. As I said, I'm just concerned because yeah, the people that are that yeah. qualify for free and reduced lunch, which we know are 75% of our students, a whole lot of them don't have transportation to get to these sites, so offering the free meal is no offer if they can't pick it up. And I don't mean the free meal, but the food for the children if they can't pick it up. And uh, again, that's a consideration of ours too, and that's something that as we continue and as, as we start moving, we'll look at the sites too. Uh, to, to look at potentially adding some more. So that, that is in our forefront and we understand that. Yeah, and again, um, Ms. Crable, we'll be serving all of our elementary children and then we'll be doing this in the evening. And so these are areas that we haven't ventured into before. So our, our team felt that it was important that we take it in kind of smaller, more manageable steps and then as we get good at it, we'll look at expanding and making it better. And if everybody in the city of Wichita and Cedric County would wear their masks, social distance, and for heaven's sakes, during the Labor Day weekend, do not gather in crowds, we can maybe get our stats down so we get more kids back in school, coming on school buses, and getting their food where we've always given it to them. Amen. Okay, I'm seeing no other questions. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been a topic that we've had lots of questions on, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I would like to call for a short break. If we can return to this room at uh, 8.10, please. Future Ready Return to School, Gating Criteria Document and COVID-19 Advisory Committee. During the special BOE meeting on August 20th, 2020, it was requested that a definitions page be added to the Wichita Public Schools Gating Criteria Document. The document will be provided at the board table at tonight's meeting. In addition, the board will receive additional information on the COVID-19 Advisory Committee. This item provides an opportunity for the board's discussion. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thompson. Okay, do you have any particular uh, order you want me to? Uh, why don't we start with the, um, the advisory board and then move to the, to the definitions? Okay, yes ma'am. Okay, so um, at the last board meeting, there was kind of, um, I just wanna make it clear for people, um, the doctors, when they came in, they recommended that we have a, um, the name of the group was a superintendent's COVID-19 advisory committee. And a lot of people were saying, well, why did you guys not have a committee working on all this stuff? And so I just kind of want to be clear about what we have been doing because we did not do this work in a vacuum. Um, and I will make note that you can find this information on our website at www.usd259 slash um, let me see, slash WPS return. This information has been there for a couple of months. 
we actually have on pages of that document 17, 18, and 19, which I have provided to the board at the table, of a significant amount of resources that we have used and partners and uh, advisory teams that have been going on for the last five months. I will take you to the external guidance that we've had. There are a number of them. The American Society of Heating and Air Con Conditioning Engineers, Centers for Disease and Control, the Council of Great City Schools, the Federation of European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning, International Sanitary Supply, Association Clean Standard, the Kansas State Board of Education, Kansas COVID Work Group for Kids, Kansas State Department of Education, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Cedric County Health Department. If you look on page 18 of that document, you will see that we have been working for the last five months with the core task force members, which is a significant amount of people. I will not name them all. There's pages of them. The Comprehensive Teacher Focus Group, the Alternative Schools and Support Staff Focus Group, Middle School Staff Focus Group. We've had stakeholder engagement, and we also have a pandemic recovery team, which meets, well, at one point we were meeting every day, <laughs> and then we were meeting everywhere. And that includes people from the health and medical area, operations, facilities, legal, human resources, finance, academics and instruction, social emotional and student supports, technology, communications, and the political activities that were occurring around this work. So I just want the team, the, the community to be aware that we did have an advisory team. It was just not called a COVID-19 advisory committee, but we had many committees working together with lots of external resources and guidance from many different sources. So with that being said, I wanted to just kind of highlight that because I wanted to make sure that our community was aware that we did have an advisory committee. However, we are going to rebuild a superintendent's COVID-19 advisory committee. And what we decided since we had so many folks that participated in and engaged with this work, that we were going to take this advisory groups that have already been formed. And what we are going to do is take representation from these, all of these advisory groups that are already working and bring them together to create another advisory team that is representative of all of these groups into a group called the Superintendent's COVID-19 Advisory Committee that you asked me to do. So it will consist of uh, parents, it will consist of, which was also in this, uh, the task force groups that we've had before, it will consist of the, Kans uh, the work group, the Kansas work group, that uh, child work group, let me get the right name so that people will know who I'm talking about. It is called the Kansas COVID workshop work group for kids. We will have representation from that group. We will have representation of, again from our pandemic leadership team. We will have representation from our city. We will have representation from our county and our health de department from the county. We will have um, people from our act act academic task force, which it will be inclusive of uh, sports as well as fine arts. We will have folks from SEIU, if they have my friend, he left me. Uh, and we will also have folks from our UTW. We will have also representation. At some point, I will get uh, uh, names from our board president, however she chooses to do that, where we will have representation from our board. And so I just want you to know that we're just taking, and if you don't know who they are and what groups we are talking about, they are on page 17, 18, and 19 of our Future Ready Return to School plan. And we will, and this has been there for a couple of months for everyone to know what our groups are. And we will be taking representations from that and we will be building another team that will be responsible for whatever direction you give of us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks like you have a good start in trying to figure out 
uh, this committee, and I am assuming you're going to do this so that we can get the committee to meet rather quickly? We are prepared to meet next week. We actually have a, uh, I have contacted one person in particular to become our chairperson, and I will also have someone there um, that will also be uh, co-chairing and supporting the work of our chairperson. Um, the rest of the folks, uh, I've kind of got halfway through the list of contacting them to ensure that they would definitely be a member. Um, and once I have everyone there and get my Board of Education members, uh, we will be prepared to set meetings this week to begin meeting next week or even if, as soon as we are able to get that set. So, yes. So, quickly, we're going to Yes. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Julie. Um, yeah, thank you, Superintendent Thompson, for um, that clarification and review of all of the folks that we have heard about all along that have been working with you on this Absolutely. On, on this crisis. Thank you. But then also your update on what you're going to do with this specific advisory team. Thank and, you. And um, I think if we um, review the minutes that were approved. Um, um, we, we kind of um, sat in the last board meeting, kind of what our direction as a team was, but I, I just want to review um, that, um, of course, this is your advisory committee. Um, it, these people will work with you, and you'll name the members that are going to be on it. Um, I think in pre previously we said you are going to meet regularly. I'm in my notes here. I have the word frequently. <laughs> and then I think the primary task that was identified in our minutes previously was that um, that that these folks would be reviewing the gating criteria. And I would like to add to that. And I guess I'll probably have to make this in a motion, but that I'd like to add to that, that they would also review any new information that was significant or important, including mental health information, if it became available. And that, of course, then in those discussions, they would take uh, information to the superintendent and she would inform um, us, the board if a special meeting needed to be called. Um, but as far as, as, as a motion, my, my primary concern is that, um, that when this team r reviews the gating criteria and we are may able to move to moderate restriction, I would move that in the school activities portion of our criteria that there would not be a requirement for a minimum of five weeks. Um, that in the event that, um, that our criteria was met for school activities, that that could happen as, as quickly as, uh, as it was able to be accommodated, but that the board would not require a minimum of five weeks. So um, to, to, um, to summarize my motion, uh, the advisory committee's charge is to review gating criteria and provide any new information, including mental health information. And secondly, that for the school activities portion of the restrictions, the five week minimum requirement is waived or dropped, whatever word you want to use. Do you want to put any length of time or do that just that it's waived? Uh, the five, the, the five week minimum, uh, or the, yeah, the five week requirement is waived. Okay. They don't have to, ab the, they do not have to abide by that five week. Okay, and you make this into, you made this into a motion? Yes, I did. Okay. My motion included review gating criteria and any new information that became available, including many mental health information. And, um, and then this goes back to the superintendent. Their information goes back to the superintendent and yeah. she contacts us. Is that the procedure? Yeah, yes, and okay. I think all of that was clear before. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. I second that. 
Okay, we do have a motion on the floor. I see some discussion. Ron? Well, I was just wanting to uh, mention, well, so let me understand this correctly. So if I make a motion to have the activities um, just reinstated, uh, would that have to go back to the task force and then they give us a recommendation or just a, a briefing on that or how, how would that uh, well, go? Well, I think if this is a motion on the floor now, so it would be a separate motion if you wouldn't want to make a different motion at a, after we deal with this one. Okay, I'll do that. Thank okay. you. Okay, any other comments, questions? Ben? Um, ben Blankley, District 1. So, uh, so if, if um, the, the subcommittee determined that yellow was an appropriate action, it would still have to come to this body to approve that move, but then when that, when that hypothetical was approved, it would be a minimum five-week turnaround for the learning model but then with your motion, the activities would be able to resume immediately after we approve that. that that's the way I would understand it working. Okay. 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 Ernestine? Well, I had understood that we kind of made a commitment to the teachers that the learning model was going to be nine weeks and that we would reconsider what was going to happen at the end of the nine weeks at, say, five weeks. I'm perfectly happy with the idea that any of the other stuff is less than, you know, could be within two weeks, could be that we change it, that, the, that our COVID committee can tell us, look, things have changed enough in this county that we could certainly have activities such that changes this. And it seems to me that that, that could be done and still we could hold to the commitment to the teachers that they're not going to have to just at any moment turn around and have to come back next week into a classroom after they've been making lessons online and preparing for nine weeks online. It seems to me that the, the academic part can set for nine weeks, that we've made this okay. commitment for nine weeks. But the other if information could be flexible enough that we could be called back at any point and have special meetings. Okay. And, and we could come back at any time and have special meetings. I think from the motion that was in our minutes, there is that five week that we could say, we could turn it around not waiting till the end of the nine weeks. And that included everything at that moment in time. Okay. And so we would just need a motion on the floor that would change that because that's the way it's set in our minutes for now from what we approved last week. Okay. I can live with that. Okay. Yeah, and that's why I specified learning um, the school activities portion because we need to we need to retain our commitment to parents and to teachers that they don't have to pivot immediately. So we we had a we had an expectation of nine weeks, but a minimum required of five weeks. That I'm I'm my motion takes school activities in the matrix out of that requirement of a minimum of five weeks. So they could be turned around within a week or whatever is However fast logistically it was possible. logistically possible for them to do that. Okay. Um, I thought, Mike, were you up? Did you want to be? Okay. Uh, do I see any other comments? All right, there is a motion on the floor made by Julie Hedrick and seconded by Ernestine that gives the direction for this superintendent's advisory committee. And um, well, I see no further comments, so let's cast your vote. Motion passes uh, six to one with Ron Rosales voting no. Okay. Other comments, questions, things that we want to talk about? Yeah, yeah, we're, I just want to make sure we finish up with this. Ron? Yeah, so I, what I was wanting to, um, I guess, make a motion on or recommend is that we have an immediate, um, for the uh, task force, an immediate review of our activities 
criteria as of now and to see if they can make some sort of uh, a recommendation within this week. Uh, since they've been, since we've had a task force going on for the last couple of months, I don't understand why we can't have a task force to advise us of current situations within our activities and our, our, the, the group of students that are affected by that and give us an, um, a recommendation, I would say by Wednesday, um, would be great and then we could vote on this possibly uh, Monday. Okay. But I, I see a really, have? really big need to insert and activate all the extracurriculars uh, throughout the district. Okay, and I just want some clarification so we know what we're looking at. You're talking about in our level orange, which is where we are right now, we Correct. have everything remote, and Correct. you're wanting to put everything back in, including the contact sports. Extracurriculars, yes, everything, uh, now, yes. Uh, Sport-wise and, because sports and the high needs sports, as well as any other kind of extracurricular activity. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Superintendent uh, Thompson, do, is it even doable to have that committee totally up and ready by that quickly? I know you've been working on it. I just don't know where you are in the process. I don't know everyone's calendar. Um, the ones that I have met with, I sit next week, but you are the bosses. I'll put together whatever you tell me to do when I can, and the people that can come can get there, and we can do it whatever you all tell us to do. Right, I just want to clarify, there seems to be a little confusion maybe within the public that first off, within the criteria, most of the district or most of the surrounding districts are working from yellow and we are working from orange. The other thing is we were told that this um, task force has been out there, so I don't see any reason why we even have to wait. If the task force has already been out there, then they should be able to review what we want them to review or what they think is prudent to review and then get back to it with well, this uh, ASAP. This, this is actually a new task force. Okay. It's going to okay. be made that's, up. That's fine. Of I, I just want to make sure that the public is understanding. But it that. is a new group. Very well. Yeah. Okay. And I want to make clear because did you make a motion? Because I want to be clear on what we what's the motion on the floor. No, I did not make a motion, but okay. I do want to make a motion that we activate all activities. All extracurricular activities. Correct. As soon, well, and again, I'm just asking for clarification. Are you wanting us to send this to committee or are you saying we're making that? Because we make the final decision on that. Right, and that's, what I, that's the other part. So it, it, I would say we make a recommendation, or I'm sorry, make a motion to have the task force make a recommendation, whatever way, whatever way they you know, want to recommend us to do or not do. Um, so I want to make a motion to have the task force review the all activities prohibition and to um, and now just you, review it and see, yeah, see you do what, realize what current. That they're going to be looking through the lens of our four categories. Correct. Green, I understand that. Yellow, orange. I understand that. But I, I feel that that was not um, conveyed or communicated last week enough so where people will understand that okay if there was this if there or since we do have this task force what what where was the input from them and well, so that i just want to make sure that we get clear on that okay so you're making a motion for us to use our new covid 19 superintendents advisory council to Correct. come back review as the motion said before review yes. the cri gating criteria and any new information that they may Correct. have yes. to be able to address the issue, bring information back to us because they don't make the decision. Right. Bring information back to Dr. Thompson about all curricular, click, cur extra all extracurricular yeah. uh, uh, activities and sports being reinstated. Yes, that's that's true. Okay, because I wanted to make sure we all knew exactly what we were thinking about. Um, I have a motion on the floor. I do not have a second. I'd like to second it with an amendment. Okay. I'd like to amend it to say that we would do it within the next week, if it runs acceptable to that. Um, yes, that's fine, next week. Okay, we do have a motion and a second well, on I, the I, floor. Let me, let me just say next week is, okay, so we got 
Monday through any time yeah. next week, or is there a specific? We don't day? start school until the eighth. Right, I understand. Well, I would, I would be thinking that we would want to make the, you know, if we're going to stop conditioning, and going to start it back up, that we would want the shortest period of time. And so I would think we would want to say, by Monday of next week, we would want to have, okay, be able to make a decision. That's fine. Yes, thank you. Okay, Ernestine. Well, if if we look at our category and we look at the orange down at the bottom under the category under the title playgrounds it does have capacity to allow for six feet of social distancing masks required if less than six feet total group numbers limited for guidelines so there's some activities under playgrounds and so that's what I'm hoping that our com that the COVID advisory committee will look and see which ones of those can fit under these categories that we have under playgrounds because I think that while maybe not every sport or extracurricular activity will fit I think that this is a very good guideline for the committee to begin to look and see which ones might fit okay. um, Julie um, I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure I understand the motion too so I so I know how to vote um, your motion is that the new COVID advisory team meet and, um, and follow the guidelines that we've set for them to meet about and to meet sometime this week mm -hmm. so that then if they have uh, information to give to the superintendent to bring back to the board to call a special meeting if she needs to call it. So no. extracurricular activities. Right. Okay, so to, specifically to regarding um, extracurricular school activities, activities the slot of school activities. Or activating them, okay. correct. Okay, and, and again, I want to make it clear, they are not making the decision. I understand that. We, it comes to the superintendent, then it comes to us. Yes. Okay, is there any other comment? Stan? Um, I'm also, Stan Reeser, District 4. I also want to make sure I understand the motion. Um, we passed Julie's motion, correct? Yes, we did. Okay. So what is the difference between Julie's motion and Ron's motion? Ron is specifically asking about all extracurricular activities. Okay. And Julie's in comfort, in comfort uh, the activities. Yeah, it's my understanding. It's the gating criteria, which is our four categories. Which includes activities. Which includes activities, and, and the where we are right now in orange is remote only on our activities. So it seemed like it's a little bit of a redundant motion if we're already reviewing activities with Julie's motion. Maybe Mike can, I can okay. I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. I said, I was hoping somebody could ex explain to me why Ron's motion is not redundant to Julie's motion when it already covers activities. I think it's tied in the timeline and in the specific pieces of uh, extracurricular activities and sports. It doesn't mean it's not there, but this is just a stronger directive for what they need to do quickly. Okay. Okay, Mike? Yeah, I can, Stan, I can clarify what I'm thinking and, and Ron, jump in here if I'm treading on here a little bit. <laughs> but what, they are similar, they're more parallel than they are intersecting. In other words, you know, if we're gonna, if we don't do anything tonight, these teams quit conditioning, which means they go their separate ways. And there's no hope until somebody meets and there's, you know, Julie's said that they were to meet and talk about it, but never set a timeline. Mm -hmm. We're setting a timeline. I, my, my thoughts were that we needed to set a timeline. And so if we're gonna bring back volleyball, say, or GROTC that they can They've got a time frame that they know they can work off of. And by saying one week, it would give them that opportunity. If that, does that clear that up for you? Uh, oh, I'll wait till I'm called. Okay. 
Go ahead. Go ahead Stan. Uh, Stan Research District 4. So really, uh, Ron's motion is accelerating Julie's motion? Yes, and I think we need to have some clarity on our gating criteria because if, and this is a huge if, if that committee says we can do X, Y, or Z, that's different than our gating criteria. So we need to probably have a rediscussion re because right now on the gating criteria we passed, right now as long as we're in orange, it's remote. What could stop that is if we move to the yellow, then under yellow, there are some activities right. that are permitted there. Some that aren't, but some that are. So we need to have that discussion as a board once we have the information from the advisory committee because they're going to look at it through this lens of what we passed. Correct. Mm -hmm. And they need to be able to use that as their screener because they're not right. the deciders. They're the ones that bring us information. And using that, then they need to get back to the superintendent and then she will get back with us to have that discussion about what we do. Okay, I, and, and I know we still have some other speakers, but I would be very interested in having uh, someone come down and address us about what we might be able to do with different sports and, and activities. So, so can you clarify what you're real, yeah, what you're wanting? I'm particularly looking at Jay. <laughs> oh, okay. So you are, you're waving out there. Okay. She, I she, come down there so I have my computer. Sure. Absolutely. She has, she has questions. They have questions about some things and you would be the perfect one to answer them. We like to use experts, and in this case, you're our expert. Okay. So that will just be easier for me to see. Absolutely. I, I'm sorry, as I hopefully can answer your questions. So I'm Jay Means, the district athletic director. So fire away. Okay. Well, I I have some to start with you. Uh, can you clarify for me because you sent you, you uh, I saw an email that had some numbers in it for cases that we had where we had COVID this summer yes. in our, mm -hmm. and can you clarify that and give us that information, please? There were six positive COVID cases between athletes and coaches throughout this summer workout when we began approximately at June 1 uh, until we stopped last Friday. Yeah, because I had always been under the understanding we didn't have any, but that's not true. Th that is not true, no ma'am. Okay, and what did we do in those cases? Do you want me to go through each case? No, just uh, generally, what was the procedure that was Well, I, it, it changes. Let's, I'll give you two prime examples. There were two incidents, one at each school of cheerleaders, one of which they had made the team, they had virtual tryouts, but had never started practice, so nobody had been around anybody, but one young lady had tested positive. So I can see where that may have not been communicated because we'd never started anything. Uh, an, another one was a cheerleader that had not been at practice for seven days prior, and she stayed away for 14 days afterwards. So in, in every one of the instances, as soon as they were discovered, then it was immediate that they, they weren't around. But a lot, uh, another one, a soccer player, uh, his last practice that he had shown up with uh, was July 28th. And if you will, let me pull up my diet mm -hmm. so I don't want to give fine. you anything incorrect. His last practice he attended was July 28th. He started having symptoms on August 2nd, got tested on August 3rd, found out he was positive on August 10th. Now beginning when uh, he said that he started having symptoms, soccer shut down for two weeks okay. just to make sure. So that's those examples. We, we reacted immediately, and uh, in the instance where the coach was positive, football stopped for two weeks. So we followed our quarantining with yes. our students and, and so on whenever we yes, discovered anything. Yes, mm -hmm. So 
and uh, believe me, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but, but if that happened in summer when our students really were making sure they were following all the rules, that could happen. We could start a sport and then have something, have to quarantine it for two weeks. There, there is always that possibility, but let me explain more of the instances. It was not, I, I think you can understand this, that it was not a contact from another student. In one instant, it, they got it from their mother, another one from a sibling. Mm -hmm. So there was the contact in the families uh, the coach contacted it from his significant other who was a health care worker. Right. So, so and that's kind of what we're seeing with our teachers, too. They, they're not really getting it from other teachers. They're getting it from other sources and bringing it right. over. Right. Families, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. My second question, you sent to the board at our request the Keisha Activity Specific Risk Management Considerations along with several other documents. Yes, ma'am. We received those. Now, now, I do want to apologize right up. I got so busy and we were talking about athletics. There are also those guidelines for ban, debate. I did not include them, but I can get those to okay, you. And I that's apologize. that's exactly my question. Well, I wondered if that might not be <laughs> where you were going. So, yeah. you know, I realized that actually today as I was looking at some information, I said, oh, I didn't even include the other activities. But they are there and I can share okay. them. Okay, because I liked that document, just personally speaking for mm -hmm. me. And I thought it gave every team, whether it was volleyball or basketball or whatever it was, the, the ground rules of what you have yes. to do in order to participate yes. and wearing masks and being as safe as we can be. And I was wondering if we had that same kind of thing for non-sport kinds of that things. That was my failure to include that. I, I sent you the packet that I had had with my athletic directors, our meetings, and, and of course we were concentrating on athletics right. at that point in time. Yeah, because my guess is we probably have some groups that wouldn't be in that packet, like Academic League. Yes, so, uh, it, it's but all But we from could Keisha. develop those kinds of things for everybody if we decided to bring sports yes. and activities uh, like back. I've already had a conversation with Colonel Hester and Keisha does not have JROTC underneath them, but mm -hmm. I gave him all that information. I said, these are good guidelines that you could start with. So yes, I believe using those, some of those other academic league being one, you could probably use debate, uh, any of those it tags along. Okay, and my last question is, <clears throat> in our criteria, the, it, even when we get to yellow, it's listed as no high risk activities. And we're gonna be talking about our definitions here in a few minutes. But, but uh, what kinds of things are in the works? Uh, because for example, football. Football's considered a high risk activity. What kinds of things are happening out here in Kansas that are kind of giving people some options? Or what kind of workarounds are we looking at for any sure. given sport that could fall into that category or not. Okay, uh, first thing I have a quick question. I'm gonna talk to you about Acacia uh, proposal that was passed by the executive board uh, late this afternoon. I got the information even after I was here. So I have it set up. If I send it to you in an email, can you pull it up now? No. Okay. All right. Well, let me just go ahead and then talk about that document. All right. And, and explain how things work. So the executive board unanimously passed this Keisha, the Bill Faflick and his team made this proposal. They passed it. It goes to a vote of the board of directors. There's 78 people on that board of directors and it goes to a vote at 3 p.m. on Friday. Okay. It has to do with inserting an alternative season for fall sports, and, and uh, they would be, the, I'll give you some start dates here in a minute, but it would be one of those, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give the instance of the Arc Valley Chisholm Trail League. Right now there's 26 teams, they surround us. They go from Salina to Arc City and El Dorado to Hutchison, 26 schools. I, I checked today, made phone calls. They are all participating in all fall sports, okay? Uh, I'm sure you are aware that uh, right now in Johnson County, 
Blue Valley, Shawnee Mission, and Olathe schools right now put on, on pause. So we don't know what they're going to do yet. Can Kansas City, Kansas, you know, school district said no fall sports. And, and I'm giving you this explanation to tie into what may happen. So if this gets voted in to where you have an alternative season, these dates will fit in, but right after winter sports start, but they get kind of squeezed. Spring sports are gonna squeeze them, okay? Um, and then there is another caveat, and what it is is if there are between all the four, five, and six A schools in the state of Kansas, and we're talking about 108 schools, if more than half of those schools decide to move over their fall sports, then it also kicks in a delay in spring sports. But if there's not more than half, what it does is it says we can still do this delayed fall sports, but now spring sports are gonna start at the scheduled time it was. And the reason I gave you all that information about different schools was I'm starting to count who is a possibility of choosing this alternative and I don't think we're gonna get anywhere near over half, okay, uh, un unless things change, all right? So that means, I'm gonna give you some examples of dates now. The alternative start for these fall sports would be March 1. If they do not move back the start of spring sports, in other words, there's not more than half, spring sports start March 1. So uh, as just an example, you know, because we, we I'm going to use football because that's the one, the high risk that we talk about the, the most. OK, I've got a lot of football players and a lot of football coaches that guess what they do track or there may be some football players that play baseball. So now we're going to have these bigger overlaps. Uh, as for instance, I, I'm looking here, and if football started on 3-1, it'd finish on 4-23. Well, track is halfway done, or any spring sport. I don't want to highlight one or the other, and somebody decide. I'm, I'm, but uh, you know, those spring sports are halfway done. So there are some issues with it. Uh, and again, I don't know how we would have football and track going on when a lot of times half my track coaches are also football coaches. So there are some things in there that, yes, it's a wonderful idea possibly to have that alternative season, but it, it's, there are some things that we definitely have to overcome. Okay, the devil's always in the details, we know that. Yes, <laughs> and, and uh, I've been already trying to pick this apart. You know, just it, it, what's the plus, what's the minus? Mm -hmm. um, but it goes to the complete board on Friday. Uh, so that would be then, you know, if it gets voted down, obviously we don't have that option then uh, as a, a solution to, to this. Does the board vote immediately so we would know Friday? Yes. Oh, if, if they're voting at 3 o'clock now, of course, they'll, they'll have discussion, I'm sure. Yeah. But I would say probably by 5 o'clock Friday you would know. Okay. And have you looked at, and I'm talking about, in general, not specifically for football or whatever, but are there any other workarounds that might be able to be done? No. Uh, no. Well, let me give you one other solution, and it ties back to the motion you just passed t tonight, or I believe so. If I misunderstand your motion, please, uh, please let me know. J the Johnson County, the three school, school districts, Shawnee Mission, Blue Valley, and, and Olathe, what they have done is they are on pause for their activities. So that means they are not practicing, okay? They, they are paused, but they haven't canceled. And uh, I was in conversations with the, some of their athletic directors today because I was trying to find out where you, where's everybody at so I could bring that to you tonight. Uh, and and they, their boards have said that they will come back and revisit it Somewhere, it depends on the school district, but somewhere between September 4th and September 8th. If they believe that they can then proceed with activities, they would get to start up practice again. 
Now that does mean there is no way you've already missed the first week of football, uh, for instance, and you've missed the first week pretty much of a lot of activity. So they would not end up being able to have what you, Keisha, would allow for the number of regular season competitions in those sports, but they could start back up. The Topeka School District, if you've noticed, uh, what they did is they're, they're still in the practice mode, but like week one of football, they're not playing and kind of reevaluating where they're at at that, at that time. So uh, those are really the solutions that I can offer because we are tied into what Keisha directs us to do as far as dates, playing dates. I mean, that's why they're having to have a whole board meeting because this was never in the works of, of a alternative season. Okay, but if we miss the first week, what does that do? I mean, I know we miss a game, but what does that do? That, that's basically it. You miss a game, uh, and, and if everything else goes as people hope, you know, instead of having eight regular season games, we might have seven re regular season games. And, and one thing Keisha has not promised from the get-go is, are we having a postseason? We don't know at this point in time. I mean, right now, yes, they're planning on it, but, you know, Again, any of us could start, you know, I, I go back to the Art Valley Chisholm Trail League. They say they're going. Week three, things happen. It goes south, and they, everybody's in the red zone, and, and seasons stop, kind of like basketball, or, because that was the last winter season last year. Basketball was finishing up, and we just unfortunately had to stop. So, it, yes, if we, do, if we say we're going to, for instance, pause – and then take a look at it like what you did as a motion right now we're paused you know uh, I said you know you can't practice now but if that committee came back and, and next week you got to vote and it said you know they proposed that we go then we'd start practice again and honestly if they missed a week of practice we'd probably have to take a look at at least uh, uh, waiting one week before competitions yeah okay Mike a couple of questions, Jay, um, and then I'm going to put my name back up on the list because there's other things that I want to do. But you, know, you talked about these these positive cases. None of those cases were hospitalized, correct? As far as I know, you are correct. Yes. And they, as far as you know, they were asymptomatic. There were no. That, Mike, I do not. That is one question that I failed okay. to ask well, the ADs. And I understand that. And Keisha's buying, the deal that you're talking about with Keisha, if Keisha comes up and says, we want to do a spring, that's not binding on the, any of the teams, is it? Uh, again, those schools can make the choice and uh, decide whether I'm doing fall sports right now or choose the alternative season. So it's really up to each school district to make that decision. And why I gave you the numbers of 108 schools, one of the uh, things that went with this is they are taking one, two, and three A schools and saying you're one band, and let's see if you have more than 50% or not, and then four, five, and six A is together uh, as, as the other band. How would uh, that affect us where we go over, we have some, well, I don't even know if we have a six. I guess East is still six A. Uh, well, actually, we have four six A schools and three five A schools. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. We so, but, and again, they would all be combined together in looking at whether you're doing the fall season or the alternative season. So, okay, I'm just trying to because basically what you're saying is, is if Keisha votes Friday, it's a non-binding deal. Yes. It's just yes, a, sir. just an opportunity. So, yes. you know, we, it, I'm not sure why Keisha's muddy in the waters here for us. But, uh, I, I can pretty much answer that, Mike, if okay. you'd like me to. I okay. Would. Um, Johnson County for quite a long time this summer has been, you know, in, in, they've had a much higher percentage of cases than we have. And so they've been talking for a long time. What happens if we don't get to 
have school uh, and, and have activities. So they really led the charge of, of just asking Keisha, do we have any alternatives? And, and, and so, you know, Keisha is just trying to, um, I guess the way I'd say is none of us have that playbook. I mean, if we had the playbook, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight. So they didn't have the playbook. How, how do you treat this year? It, we've never had to deal with anything like this. So really it was like, okay, let, let's come up at least for an option for uh, some, some schools to have if they can't participate this fall. One more question. We were talking about football being a high, high risk activity. And I know in talking to the coaches this weekend that they've been practicing, even with helmets, with their face masks on, which reduces that that we're worried about. Um, has that been addressed by Keisha? Uh, I, Mike, I'm not for sure I know what you mean other than... Wearing masks in competition. Okay. Uh, two things there. Uh, a rule change was made where a, a player can wear a, a, a mask of some sort when they're playing. And I, I don't know if you've seen, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of them. A lot of them have the, the little neck thing and they bring up, oh, excuse me. Um, but uh, that has really been the, the best way for football to go because, okay, I'm supposed to be wearing my mask when I'm on the sideline. And can you imagine a football coach telling a kid to go in? He goes, hold on, coach, i got to get my mask off and, and drop it back over here in my bag, and then I'll go in and play. So that one of those changes was that they would be allowed to have those. They also, uh, there is some face shield things that can attach to the face mask that the NFHS is also uh, deemed legal. Uh, that would be an option uh, for players if they want. And, and so it's kind of a clear thing that s snaps in on their face mask. So it, uh, I, I would compare it to some of our folks have the face shield along with the mask. I mean, the clear, it, it's just one that fits in the face mask. So um, then they've made some other changes to the rules to be able to spread down. Like the players now can be on the sideline from the 10-yard line to the 10-yard line. Uh, coaches can't. They're not going to get to go uh, and holler at a referee down the way. But there, there are uh, adaptations at every sport to, that are, are being made to, to be able to allow that. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, Mike. in other words, what you're saying is, is they're wearing masks when they're in competition on the field, not just on the sideline. They, they are not required to when they're in the game, but they can. But uh, I would tell you most of them, they'll pull that down when they're in. The, when they're in. And, and again, if you go back to the Keisha guidelines too, anytime I'm doing the physical activity, I do not have to have a mask on. But there are those, those rule changes to allow that if, if a player wants. But I guess what I'm saying is, is when I talk to coaches this weekend, they are telling their, their players to keep their masks on when their helmet is up and they're in competition. Yeah. And they're, they're learning they're, to breathe with the masks. They are, you know, because a lot of them, I think, are more comfortable with and they that. Wanna, yes. you know, they want to play that bad. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to sacrifice that. And, you know, the social distancing on the sidelines, too, is what they, they're able to do with. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're complying with all the rules. And then there's right. all these wipe down right. rules and things right. like that and that I won't get into. Pre but President Logan, could I go back? You asked about the six COVID cases. Yes. Um, if, if you know, well, I just want to point this out. Four of the six, I don't know why, but it involved cheer and dance, cheer or dance one soccer player and one football coach. We had no football players. Uh, I think they probably some of the most, the, the coaches were on them maybe even more than others. Uh, and, and also my point was to, to notice how many kids we had active this summer, 1,500, over 1,500, and we had six cases. Uh, I'll do the math for you, that's 0.004%. Uh, of those participants. So uh, I, 
while we were not perfect over the summer, I, I, you know, I, I would admit that freely that uh, you probably saw a video here or there and a mask wasn't on or whatever, but I, I believe our coaches and our kids tried their best to make sure they got through the summer safely. Okay. Ben? Um, yeah, so, uh, so we had six cases so far among uh, student athletes and staff. Uh, small quarantine so far, maybe not even any in some cases. Um, we've been lucky, I think, um, in terms of, of our exposure risk. Uh, in, our, in our staff and our buildings, we've had some larger scale quarantines um, for maybe a half a dozen to a dozen people um, because they were you know, close together and, you know, and even if you've got a mask on, it, you might be considered a close contact if you, know, you, meet this, you meet the health department guidelines. So that's not our decision to make those quarantines, that's the health department's guidelines. Um, my concern is that we have the potential for large scale quarantines um, if we continue on this path. Um, in two circumstances recently, uh, Blue Valley West had three confirmed COVID cases related to their football program and their health department quarantined all 120 students and staff. Um, now they might come back and it, it, might, it might be okay. You know, they might not have had any transmission at the, at the game, um, but that's still 120 students and staff that not only can't practice, but they can't go anywhere else. They can't go to the grocery store. They can't go to school if they are an in-person student and that's available. Um, and then in, in Coyle, Oklahoma, uh, and, and that happened on Friday. That was after our Thursday meeting that that happened. Um, and like, like you mentioned, they're on pause right now and they're going to reevaluate. Um, and then in Coyle, Oklahoma, which is near, uh, I think it's near Langston, um, it's a pretty small school district. Uh, they started in-person school last week, and uh, they had to shift to 100% remote learning because their school superintendent had visited every, every classroom to say hi to kids at the beginning of school, and he has a COVID case. And so now their entire school district, now granted it's a small school district, but that's, I mean, that's, that's like 100 miles away from here. It's not, it's not, you know, Georgia or Florida or Texas or, or anything like that. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the social media uh, group that was formed for the protest at Northwest and then the one tonight, um, there were a couple concerning uh, posts in there from, from parents and family that I mean, there were, there were people that were saying, yeah, we need to go down there, we need to wear a mask, we need to social distance, we need to do all the right things and show that we're doing the right things. And yeah, it was just a minority, but there were a couple, a couple family members that commented in there that said that they don't believe in masks, they don't, they don't use them in public, or, and they don't social distance, but they'll do it for this. And that's, that's just, a, you know, it's just a little more concerning for me that you know, it, really for us to do this right, we got to have everybody on board um, because just, just one kiddo or one staff member that has close contact with a bunch of people can put this entire plan out the window. Um, I mean, right now, the, the level of community spread is as such where if you grabbed 500 random Wichitans, there's going to be a COVID case in there. A confirmed one, not necessarily even the ones that haven't been tested and are asymptomatic. And so, I mean, like every decision we're making here, it's rolling the dice. And I just, I just don't, I just don't understand. It. I don't think it's responsible to wait until we have a confirmed mass exposure that requires 120 students and staff out on quarantine to say that. I don't think this is a great idea. I mean, it sucks. It really sucks. It sucks that we can't have sixth graders through 12th graders in schools right now. Um, I, don't, I don't know, it's just, 
it's frustrating. And you know, we can we can do all, we can do all the plans. We can work really hard. We can get these kids back on the field and behind their you know sousaphones and and all that. Um, and we can put a lot of effort into it. But if just a tiny tiny minority of folks aren't doing the right thing at every time, at every opportunity, then all of our plans are for naught. And then we're back in the same situation that we are right now where we have all activities canceled. Um, I, I just, I, it, you know, I, if, if the motion passes and we send, send it off to a committee to discuss, um, and the committee does come back and say, yeah, it's it's cool. Uh, you know, we we agree that that it's it's appropriate for activities to resume. Um, I I I think we're just going to be back where we are right now. I hope we're not. I hope we're in. I hope we're in clear yellow in another couple of weeks. I, I you know I I hope that everybody is gonna. But I hope that in April. I hope that in May. And and we're not there. Um. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but I want to be realistic. I guess the real, the real, it's really not a question. It's more of a statement, but that's, you know, we're political entities and that's what we do. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. By the way, I saw pictures of, I don't know if it was dance or cheer, but it was one or the other, at Northwest with no masks, standing right by her friends that did have masks on. So even though we've preached, we still have people not doing it. Ernestine? Um, I assume that, like here in Cedric County, that we are not testing every one of our players, are we? No, that, they, that's not available. I, right. And, and I may be wrong, but it, the way I understand it now, unless you've got some symptoms, I just can't walk up there and say, I want to be tested. Exactly. And the professional sports they're testing all of their players they can do that they've got the money and they've got the mean so we're having to wait until somebody says they have symptoms then they can and even then having gone through this I know that I have to let them know what my symptoms are and if my symptom is a sore toe they probably won't let me test because that's not a COVID related um, so my concern is we don't know how many kids, even though we've talked about how many that we know for sure, we don't know how many kids or adults might have been asymptomatic, but might have COVID. And my concern is about those going out from there to other kids and other families and other grandparents. And because I feel a responsibility to our whole community, to the whole community of Wichita, to not set up a situation like Ben was talking about where um, I really appreciate that the fact that the f coaches and the kids are trying to do it. I was, a, like Ben, dismayed at the number of people trying to convince us that we should change our mind, and yet a lot of them out there had no masks on and were very, very close to each other. It's like, don't you get it? <laughs> so. Um, so the kids get tested if they have symptoms. That's the way, just like anybody else in Cedric County. The, the only thing I would add, if you read what I sent uh, to you from Keisha, you know, and, and you may have even seen some video, I saw some video that they could, you know, we followed what Keisha asked us to do. We're doing the temperature checks. We're asking those questions. They're keeping mm -hmm. that chart every day. Uh, so without the ability to just request tests like the MLB and the NBA can mm -hmm. do, you know, we were doing what we were given as guidelines as the best practice we could have. Exactly. Uh, you know, and, on, and, oh, no, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say on our chart, as I was mentioning earlier, down here at the bottom under the, uh, playgrounds issue it says capacity to allow for six feet social distancing mass required if less than six feet social distancing maintained total group numbers are limited could you think about and come back with us for which sports without us changing anything 
which sports could fit within that category. For example, tennis, golf. Some of those would certainly fit within this category. The other thing is, is there's a possibility that if we did change and start to have some sports that we could make a rule, uh, a, a direction, that the kids would come in their uniforms or their costumes, whatever, never go into a locker room, never go into a, a dugout, and go home in those outfits and not have to ever have to be up close inside of the building. So if we could have outdoor activities type thing, could we make such a thing? Well, I, I would answer that. Uh, and, and even when uh, we were in school, I mean, like, like soccer players, they, they'd run the locker room change and they're out the door. But where I'm going, you know, if we are in full remote, which right now we are, those kids would actually be showing up to, to practice or a game they're coming there in their gear we had already made plans that if we were playing football that those teams you know we bust them we'd already talked about going one per seat which meant that i was going to have to have three or four buses per team versus the two and then they they would just know when they got there unless we had a weather situation they were not using the locker rooms. We already had planned on, on, on a lot of that type of thing. Because we, um, for instance, you know, if Northwest is playing south down at Carpenter Stadium and somebody else is at Northwest playing, we couldn't have a team go into the Northwest locker room and get it all cleaned up before Northwest came back. Now, uh, football is that one unique thing. I just don't get to carry my helmet and my shoulder pads around everywhere. So, it, But if we are in full remote, yes, that kid could take that home every day and then come back. Uh, so, But to answer your question, there are a lot of those things we were already talking about that, that could be adapted like that, for sure. Okay. Okay. Stan? Jay, I want to start off by, Stan Reeser, District 4. Jay, I want to start off by saying, uh, Thank you and the coaches and the players who did participate in summer conditioning. I think overall, yes, there was a few mistakes made, just like the Board of Education is going to make a few mistakes during this process, just like school administrators will make a mistake here and there. But overall, I think the effort was really great, and it was a really good, uh, a, a great effort. I just want to bring this back to the motion that's on the table, though, and let me see if I can simplify this I think all of us want activities to get spot checked our criteria to be spot checked based off of Julie's and Ernestine's motion that passed so we want to review I guess where I'm concerned about is a parallel motion and I'll let Mike and Ron explain it again to me a parallel motion, I just want to make sure that parallel motion is not saying prejudging or telling the advisory board what to tell us after they've spot checked our criteria and our activities. And if Ron or Mike want to just confirm that, that this parallel motion, which is basically saying the same thing as Julie's motion, except maybe speeding it up a bit, is not prejudging anything. Correct. That's your that's your understanding. Well, that I, was your intention with I'm your motion. I'm hoping that they just be as objective as possible. And I th yeah, I think yeah, we all agree then, with that. Um, I mean, you know, there's going to be some things that you know they're going to probably feel one way or another, but you know, we just don't know. We we need to look at all the um, guidelines and like like Jim was saying. I think he you know said it very well. This is what happened. This is our. Uh, uh, this is what happened over the summer. This is our um, situation, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, yeah, I'll go from there. And you know, if they they have anything else, any other opinions? Just part, like I think somebody had mentioned mental health and and the social well-being of our students. Uh, that's another aspect that we're going to have to consider. Those are a little bit more subjective. But we're not taking this as 100% objective. We, we need to look at the social, emotional well-being of our students. 
Which we did. In which we moment. did, but I think that we're overlooking. There's another part, but I'll wait until the end um, uh, when we get into reports to kind of just kind of um, reiterate my, my case. But either way, um, what, you're saying, what you said is correct, though. Stan, let me add to that just a little bit. You know, all, I'm, all I wanted to do when I said the seven-day time frame was to accept, you know, Julie's, Julie's deal is, is good. Don't have a problem with that. But because these teams are in conditioning mode right now, and if we wait two or three weeks for the committee to get assembled, get to going, you know, we've already got the committee parameters already there. What I'm saying is, is let's say, let's give them a seven day window to make a ruling on this portion of it. And there's going to be more things that they're going to need to decide and discuss. But for the, the athletes and these, the uh, activities, the band, the orchestra, the Jero TC, and I want to make sure those are all included in there that uh, we're just putting a time frame on it to, to okay. accelerate it. Permission to comment? Yes. Okay. So you're not, you're not asking for any prejudgment? No. Okay. And then all you're doing, what Ron's motion is doing is accelerating Julie's motion. Uh, you, you could say that, yes. Yeah. It's just this, on this one subject. I don't want to, you know, if we have 20 subjects. I see. It's just the the activities that I'm trying to accelerate so that we can. You're you're trying to accelerate the activity. section on activities. That's correct. So and I, so I guess the question would be, Dr. Thompson, is it possible to accelerate the the committee reporting back to us within seven days? Yes. Then I don't have any problem supporting Ron's motion. Okay, um, I just want to make sure that we all understand what we're what we're doing. Our committee. I do not want to transfer the thousand emails that I've gotten to that committee. I don't want the public thinking, "Oh, I can call whomever, and they will, you know, listen." That that's not the intent of this committee. This is an advisory only committee. They do not right. make a decision. And all of their decisions is based on what we have already passed, which is this guide, this gating guide. And currently, unless we are in yellow or green, this gating guide says remote only. So they may look at this and say, following this guide, here's what we're giving advice, uh, the information back to the superintendent on. Then that comes into us and we're the only ones that can make the decision on, do we change this? But, but what I'm fearful of is that, that the people out there are gonna think, I can start calling that committee and it'll make a difference. It won't make a difference. The reason is they're looking at this guide. That's their driver. And I wanna make sure we're all clear on that. Sure. We're not asking them to do anything different other than pay attention to what we've already passed. President Logan. To, uh, to, yes, Mike, you're next. To, and I'm just, I want to reply to your comment. I think I can help you out there is if, you know, I understand what you're saying and I agree the committee should not be contacted by the athletes or the or coaches anybody. or anybody. And I think all we have to do is have Jay talk to the athletic directors at each school and ask them to leave the committee alone and I, would be shocked if they weren't left alone. I so, hope you're right. So, you know, and I think if we make that clear enough, you know, these guys want to do it. They're, they want it so bad they can taste it. And they're, they're competitive and they, they want to be on the playing field and they're willing to, to do what it takes to be on the playing field. And so I, if one of the requirements is, is stop the emails, stop the phone calls, well, to them, we, to them, we should get them. They I understand. Should not. I understand. But I'm, I'm saying that I think all we have to do is tell Jay to tell the athletic directors at each high school to say, don't do this. I would be stunned if it's not followed, I'll say 99%, because I'm sure there's going to be one person that thinks they're better than the law. But 
I would hope that we could be 100 percent. So uh, to, to, to your question, I think that's what could happen. Julie? Um, Mike did say that we're in conditioning mode now. I thought now, as of today, we were paused. Y yes. Uh, I, I, I know what Mike meant. We, they've been working out in conditioning since June 1. So they have been in that mode. And I w would like to add this. I I'm sure some of you saw some video or pictures of them working out on Friday and, and Saturday. And I will take full blame because I hope you understand that they felt this might be it. And, and they needed some time to process. Uh, and I'm sure you saw some of my quotes. I said they might not follow social distancing because I can tell you right now as a coach and an athlete, if my last day, I find out on Thursday night, my last day is really then, but I'm, I'm Friday, I've got tears. I, I've got to hug my kids uh, and, and, and try to build them back up because they're devastated at that moment. So. I take full responsibility for that over the weekend, but the message was sent this morning that, you know, right now, until there's a further notice, there are no practices now. They could meet, they, you know, if they have equipment that they need to check in, th those type of things, I, I would hope you would allow, we, we, you know, we need, but we, we needed some finalization, I, I guess, uh, and, and, and so, uh, I, I think that's what you meant, Mike, that they've been in conditioning mode. If one week of not working out and then a decision was made to change, they could get back into that uh, mode. I, I think we'd have to take a look. Uh, couldn't be ready for a September 4th football game, let's be honest, you know, but we could adjust schedules that way. Jay, let me add what I'm what I was meaning by that. I mean, if we if we're saying there could be a decision made in a week that they're back on the field, then they're going to condition at home because they're trained athletes and that's what they're going to do. They're going to find ways to stay in conditioning mode until there is no hope to uh, to play anything. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, could, we could be talking about volleyball or we could be talking about golf. I mean, those kids could probably be, are probably in their backyard hitting into a net. They're in conditioning mode. They're, and that's what I'm talking about. They may not be doing it at school with their teammates, but, you know, they may be at Genesis lifting weights, which, you know, that's what I'm doing right now. I go to Genesis and lift weights. I know I'm... Don't make any. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, a, a lot of a lot of the athletes would do that, and there's some that's not. But again, it, it, one week it, that um, one week for us is a lot different than one week for a teenager. But I just wanted Julie to make sure that she understood that conditioning mode means yeah. what it means. If if they can't do it as a group, they're going to do it on their own and maintain. Thank you for explaining what you meant, and I, I, we've, we've reviewed this a couple of times, but I just want to make sure I understand, too. We're just simply voting for an advisory team to meet quickly and reply to us based on our current gating criteria. We're not making a motion to modify the gating criteria or anything in that regard. We're just asking our team to meet quickly so that we can know soon, before school starts maybe, <laughs> um, if, we, if our city has, has, uh, has gotten to a different um, situation. And, and maybe we could have Dr. Mike read the motion back to us, no? Okay, the way, <laughs> the that, way, the way I have the motion, the way I have the motion, and it may not be exactly right, he will review the meeting to give us the exact wording. But what I have is that Ron made the motion, Mike seconded, and that it is this task force m make a uh, recommendation to reinstate, look at making a recommendation to reinstate all extracurricular activities within the next seven days. They look at the reinstatement based on our criteria. We're not telling them to do anything 
other than look at the criteria and see where we are now and tell us what we need to do. That'll come back to the superintendent and then it would come to us and we would need to call a special meeting. Thank you for that to, clarification. To make any, any other kinds of decisions. I would say or sooner, but obviously we have that, you know, compromise, so yeah. That's yeah. It. Well, I think we're trying to move as fast as we can. Yes, yes, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Julie, did you, are you finished? Uh, yeah, I'm Okay, I'm Ernestine? Well, I do hope that these young people, as much as I really understand their passion for getting back into the sports and stuff, will stop and think about all of those medical workers. They, when something happens in a community, it's not gonna be the students that really, as a community, suffer. It's gonna be the medical workers. It's gonna be the families of the people. And so I'm hoping that they understand that as important as sports are, as important as extracurricular activities, that lives are just really what we're all about here. We wouldn't, any one of us, want to deprive those kids of an education or the, all of the involvement. But we have to remember that this is about a whole community and about what's going on in our hospitals and going on in our homes where people, grandmothers are dying and things. So I know that the kids are thoughtful and I also know that the coaches are reminding them of, of that kind of thing, but I just want them to keep it in, in perspective. Sports as compared to the lives of those nurses and doctors who are having to deal with the cases that come in. That's all. Okay, and, and I put my name back on because there was a question about what I said. I wanna make sure that it's abundantly clear this committee is not changing our rubric, our gating criteria. We're the only ones that can do that. And we're, all we're asking them to do, based on Julie's motion, they're expanding that to consider the extracurricular activities, even though that's part of our gating guide, it's a specific piece. But the committee that Julie, the motion that Julie made and Ernestine seconded and passed, says that that committee is a committee that reports to the superintendent, uses the gating criteria to give us information. They're still gonna be using the gating care committee. They're still gonna be giving us information, but it's looking a little more closely at their extracurricular activities. Is that clear now, Alicia? Very clear, thank you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I just didn't want it to be confused. Okay. Can we vote now? Uh, you can call the question, absolutely. Call the question. Okay. The question has been called, and I actually see no more speakers. So are we all clear on what we're voting on? Okay. Please. Kind of. Whoops, our machine is gone. Can we still vote, even though it's not on the screen? There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Please pass, cast your votes. Okay, it passed 6-1 with Cheryl Logan voting no. So we will ask the uh, COVID-19 Advisory Committee to meet quickly, look at that criteria along with the extracurricular activities and bring back information to you, which you will then bring to me. And we'll need to look at when we can call a special meeting, but it's gonna depend on when that committee can meet. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we okay with that? And again, I please ask our public, do not flood this committee with your emails. It won't make a difference. They're looking at specific things and that's just not fair to community members to have the kinds of emails that all of us have had. Okay, Mike, did you have something else to say? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing that you did, but a little more direct if I could to, to Dr. Thompson, if, it, if it's all right that I direct your employee, Jay Means, to tell his athletic directors not to uh, flood the committee with emails. Jay Means, please tell your uh, <laughs> 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 uh, As the board member has directed, um, uh, please mm -hmm. ask them to refrain from um, sending the emails so that the committee can work and sure. do due diligence mm -hmm. to that. Um, I will just kind of reiterate, there is a chair to this committee 
and as all of these advisory committees, um, I don't sit on them. So I do not sit on this team. Uh, however, the team has a chair and committee members that they will work with, and then they will bring the information that they've gathered in their team to me. And I'm trying to make sure I understand this correctly and you take me up if I'm wrong. And then I then will, do I call a meeting or do I give the, who do I give the? Talk, call, call me as the board president and I will make sure the other board members know when a meeting is being scheduled. Got it. But we can't set it tonight because we don't know when the committee's meeting. That is correct, but we'll move extremely fast because Ron Rosales said so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Stan, you. did you have something else to add? Yeah, just real quick, Stan Research District 4. If we're going to ask this committee to uh, get to convene very quickly, um, should we name the two board members that are going to be on that committee uh, tonight or? I will be visiting with the superintendent about that. It'll probably be the board officers. That's, that's fine. That's normally what we do. That. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> next item, Mike. Can I assume that I I'm yes? You, thank you very the, much. We yeah, appreciate your help. But I will make you, sure we, I follow. We Dr. we believe Thompson's in bringing experts, and you were ours tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next item, Mike. Under miscellaneous superintendent's report, Dr. Thompson. I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next item. BOE report requests. Um, ben? Ben Blankley, District 1. I have nothing. Ernestine? Ernestine, number three. Nothing. <laughs> Julie? <laughs> Julie Hendrick, District 2. I have nothing. Cheryl Logan, at large, nothing. <clears throat> Mike? Mike Rody, District 5. I want to go home. <laughs> well, we have an executive council so, uh, meeting, so Stan? Stan Research District 4, no Board of Education report or request. Stan, I mean, Ron, I looked right at you. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm just uh, really impressed to see what all the teachers are doing out in the district um, and all the preparation that's being done. And I really appreciate it, all the work and effort of administrators and all the teachers. Again, uh, thank you very much. I just want to close by just saying that, uh, you know, this vote that we're going to do about the activities. I want everybody to understand that, you know, in a time when we're living in uh, social and racial injustice, that this is something that we all need to consider because uh, most of this district is make up, made up of minority students. And so if we don't get something where we can communicate to our minority students, particular uh, males of color, that play a lot of these sports. And so I really want you guys to really consider it because Ben had mentioned about unintended consequences. It's true, but we really need to see. There's a, it can go either way, but we really need to look and see what the unintended consequences are uh, for the district as a whole when, when uh, students, uh, particularly in, in our city, are looking outside uh, and looking at other uh, students playing, which it, it's not going to look like them. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. So. I just want everybody to kind of understand where I'm coming from when I, when I advocate for this. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in our nation, as in particular with social and racial injustices. So um, just consider that and um, you know, hopefully uh, we'll make the best decision and, and uh, given the information that we're given. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. New business. I'm seeing none. Executive session. Julie. I move the board recess into an executive session to discuss the status of current negotiations between the BOE and United Teachers of Wichita pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act exception as allowed under KSA 75-4319 and the board return from executive session to this room at 10 o'clock. Stan Reeser, District 4, second. It was moved by Julie and seconded by Stan. Please cast your votes to go to executive session. <coughs> Motion passes 7 0. We are in executive session.
call the meeting back to order. Next item, Mike. Adjournment. Ben Blankley, District 1, I move we adjourn. I second it. This is Ernestine Crable, District 3. Okay, a motion was made by Ben Blankley and seconded by Ernestine Crable. And we're gonna cast with a hand vote. Please uh, raise your right hand to adjourn the meeting. Motion passes 6-0. Good night, we'll see you later. <laughs>